All right, good morning, everyone. I'd like to open the meeting call to order. Can we have a roll call, please, Mr. Angelus? Yes, good morning. Uh, Alex Lawrence? Uh, Present? You are muted here. That's interesting because he's definitely not. Uh, Mr. Angelus, can you do roll call, please? Can you guys not hear me? We can, can hear you. I can hear you. Can they hear him? Maybe we can. We can, can hear him. Maybe we can, but I wonder if they can. Can you hear me? There you yes. go. Yes. 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 Just not Ezra. Can you try again, right. Ezra? Okay. I'm going to try muting and. Yeah, that's it. That's it. That's it. Got it. We can hear you. Okay. Uh, Alex Lawrence? Here. Dr. Bolton? Here. Robert Brody? Here. Dr. Cow? Uh -huh. Alex Chan? Here. James Efting? Here. Kareem Gangora? Dolores Heisinger? Here. Judge Herman? Michael Isseri? Larry Kaplan? Paul Kramer? Esther Lynn? Bethany Peak? Vince Reyes? Here. Thank you. Judge Toyolba? David Torres? Here. Thank you. Dr. Wilkerson? Here. Thank you. All right. So um, as it looks now, we do not have quorum. I think we're anticipating two more members to join. Um, I believe we're waiting for Kareem Gangora and also um, Judge Tori Alba. Um, perhaps what we can do, um, I recommend, uh, I'll leave this to you, um, Alex. Um, but is uh, we start with the informational set, uh, items but, uh, because we will not be able to uh, valid, validly uh, vote um, given that we do not have quorum. I agree with that. And uh, should we go into public comment? Oh, yeah, he's here. Kareem is here. Oh, hey, Kareem. Hey, how you doing? We Good. Do how are you? We'll still need one. Or just one more to proceed. Just from Judge Troy, we are live. We are live. <laughs> You're on the screen. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so, uh, Ms. Gungora just arrived, and we need, I believe, how many more? Two more for him? One more. One more for quorum. Okay. Uh, so, with that, I'd like to go through the logistics and, and my comments, and then we can go into public comment. So as noted on the agenda for today's meeting, public comments during the meeting will be limited. Members of the public wishing to comment were encouraged to submit written comments prior to the meeting to ensure that the committee would have time to consider those comments. The committee has received and read all the written public comments, so we thank you for that. We will attempt to call members of the public in the order that they appear to facilitate hearing as many members of the public as possible. I encourage you to not to repeat points that were made by previous speakers and to allow the committee the time needed to deliberate on the important topics that it will be discussing today. We will be limiting public comments to two minutes per person. For those of you who are participating via Zoom video, you should have a function for virtually raising your hand. It's a hand icon and should appear at the bottom center of your screen. If you wish to make a public comment, please click on that. For those of you who are participating by phone, you may virtually raise your hand by pressing star nine. That's the star key, then the number nine. The coordinator will call members of the public in the order that they identify raised hands and will enable the microphones of the speakers. As discussed at our last CBE meeting, we'll be taking public comments from law schools in a different format. At today's meeting, law school deans that would like to make public comments during their during their corresponding agenda item will be will be allowed to do so once their agenda has been presented by the subcommittee chair and staff. 
We also have various locations noted on the agenda and will open for public comment at each of those locations. Once we hear public comment from public members attending via Zoom. To start, Ms. Nunez, do we have any public comments from public members attending via Zoom? We have, we have one hand raised um, right now, Alex. Great. Can we promote um, Benjamin Cohn? Mr. Cohn? Hello, thank you. I wanted to comment regarding the upcoming July 2022 exam FAQs. At the moment, they seem to suggest that immunocompromised uh, examinees will not be able to request testing accommodations other than a private room and that there will no longer be a mask mandate or a vaccine or test mandate. Uh, I would like to encourage a change to this policy to require masks at the as a standard condition, but at least to re allow to allow or clarify that individualized testing accommodations for the proctors of such a person uh, it, to wear a mask or to have to wear a mask will be entertained. Same thing with testing negative before the exam for said proctors. There was according to the public records released to me, a super spreader event at the disabled applicant testing site in Burlingame for the February 2022 exam, even when there was ostensibly a mask and vaccine mandate. So uh, there should definitely be more precautions. The numbers are not lower now than they were then. Thank you. Thank you. That's um, all the hands I see raised at the moment, Chair. Thank you. So the next item on the list that I would like to go to would be item D, a report back from the 2022 National Conference of Bar Examiners Annual Conference. And uh, before I ask Mr. Gungor to give his own sort of uh, feedback on his attendance, um, I also had the opportunity to go to the conference and it was my first time attending uh, one for the NCB, and, and I was really uh, uh, pleasantly surprised. I thought uh, many of the uh, agendas, uh, topics that I actually uh, went to, very informative. Um, I thought it would be keynote with the Honorable Carly Stewart from the United States Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals uh, was really um, a great way to kick things off on um, his comments about um, equity and access um, sort of with a different lens being down there in um, the South, in you know, New Orleans, you had a number of attendees obviously from all over the, the country, but just hearing uh, about sort of like things to consider for those individuals who are in a very rural parts of that part of the country. And then just sort of his own take on the new normal of like doing a, uh, meetings like this uh, via Zoom, um, moving into a hybrid fashion, um, Again, just hearing sort of like the perspective of conducting business uh, down in that part of the country um, versus uh, again a lot of just my own experiences uh, out here in Los Angeles. Uh, while I wasn't um, uh, extremely surprised, but it was good to hear just another perspective given his uh, background experiences. I also attended the uh, test test security in the age of social media event um, that they did have. It was a, a packed room. Um, and just uh, while uh, there were a lot of things I had, I'm very much aware of, but they went over, uh, say, uh, platforms like Twitter and LinkedIn and just kind of, again, just give a big perspective on how to use uh, some of those uh, uh, platforms and resources uh, for recruiting, sharing information and things of that nature. So, uh, but let me turn it over to Ms. Gungor to give his own sort of uh, perspective on the the uh, annual conference and maybe what he did attend. Up there. Oh, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And uh, I did have the opportunity to attend uh, the National Committee uh, Conference of Bar Examiners. Um, this is my second time attending. And I can tell you that um, the, the interesting part about our jurisdiction is, is when you compare it to others, there's literally not many that can compare. Um, but, but it's also interesting to see the way people are tackling the issues that we're trying to address. And so the definitely, I, I think that the, the greatest conversations that are being had 
um, statewide and uh, nationwide are about the diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and, and I think one of the things that I found very important um, is that it's really ingrained and really trying to be more intentional uh, because I, I, I hear it, I keep hearing about it. <clears throat> I know that we talk about it, but but I think we have to codify in policy. And so they had a very interesting um, plenary session that had two lawyers uh, that are actually civil rights attorneys tackling um, this conversation and about what it means directly in communities of color um, and what that conversation is playing out nationwide. And so um, definitely enlightening, very uh, enriching. There's the, the biggest. I think conversation as well as the uh, the future of the bar exam, and so um, everyone's kind of dealing with that and trying to address the evolving technology and the, and the learning needs of this um, new normal that we keep speaking of. So uh, definitely was a good time, and uh, definitely appreciate being there representing uh, the state of California. Great, thank you, Ms. Gongora. Thank you. So also another member who did attend the conference, uh, Ms. Esther Esther Lynn. She's not here, uh, so she, uh, but. She did send um, some notes or some comments that she would like me to share as well that she thought, uh, given her uh, past attendance at other annual bar conferences, she saw she thought again this was very well organized, especially for uh, putting it on um, after being paused for the last couple of years, and so um, she thought it was really informative and uh, wanted to wanted just me to sit, uh, share those comments as well. The next item on the list. Uh, is the discussion of the sub entity administrative processes and procedures. I want to pause on that and hopefully uh, we'll have uh, the remaining uh, members join us and I'll circle back to that because I think it's really important to share uh, the message uh, from that particular item. With that, I want to turn it over to the director for her report, Ms. Nunez. Thank you, Alex. Uh, I have a PowerPoint that um, I uh, that will should be coming up. Okay, great. Uh, so the first thing I want to report on is um, on our upcoming schedule. Uh, so we have a CBE meeting. Our next meeting after uh, this one is on August nineteenth and twentieth. Uh, it's a two day meeting, and uh, it's currently scheduled as a teleconference. Uh, just to remind everybody, day two of this meeting, August 20th, is second the second calibration for the July bar exam. And I want to encourage all CBM, uh, CBE members to attend. Uh, the session will be a remote session. Um, that is, calibration will be remote. Um, and uh, anybody who's interested in attending will be asked to RSVP in advance. And I also request that if you RSVP, it's very important to show up. Um, you uh, members get assigned to a, a grading group, um, and that grading group, uh, you know, prepares material for um, all of the attendees. So again, upcoming meeting is a two-day meeting uh, scheduled for August 19th and 20th. I also want to alert the CBE that uh, we will be having two in-person meetings um, before the end of the year. So uh, just to give everybody the heads up. Uh, we plan to have the October meeting in Los Angeles in person. So um, please um, make note of that and we will uh, send more information about uh, the details um, in terms of the travel and so on uh, as, that, as that meeting uh, comes nears. The other um, item is, uh, the other meeting is we're planning to uh, have an in-person meeting for December. Um, and remember, uh, December is also a two-day meeting because uh, we have question selection in December. We're scheduled, uh, we're planning to have that in San Francisco, but this is contingent on having the space. You know, uh, I talked about the Zoom room setup that we are uh, tackling in San Francisco. So um, this is tentatively scheduled for San Francisco. If we do not have the meeting space, that we will have to uh, schedule that in Los Angeles and our question selection will have to be a uh, teleconference. So um, this is just a heads up on the meetings for October and December, but August will be a teleconference exactly like today's meeting. Any questions about the upcoming meetings? Uh, Amy, what are the dates in October? Uh, October, give me one second, David. Um, in October, we are scheduled to meet on the, um, I believe it's the 21st. Okay. I'm sorry, it's the 14th. 14th. October 14th is our um, CBE meeting. Okay, thank you. 
Okay. All right. Uh, next slide, please. So um, these are key statistical indicators. I send these out um, uh, for at every meeting. And this reports uh, basically the, number, the, the incoming applications that we receive here in the Office of Admissions. And what I do is I highlight anything that's got um, over a 20% differential. And as you can see here, uh, we have uh, quite uh, we have a few. Um, and some of these are um, have been uh, there's been a trend in some of these. Uh, so let's look at the applicants on the motion. As you can see, there's a 255% decline, and this is related to the late release of results for the October 2020 exam. So in October uh, 2020, that, that was the July uh, bar exam, our grading uh, uh, was delayed because we had a uh, the the exam was delayed, and what that. Uh, created was the release of grades in January. So we had more people placed on the motion in the year of 2021 uh, than ever, and, and probably won't happen again uh, because of the um, postponement of the July 2021 bar exam. Uh, the other items are uh, law school, uh, law student registrations. We have a 24% decline when you compare this April and May to 2021 along with the general bar examination applications and attorney examination applications. Uh, for the bar exam, we have a 27% decrease compared to last April and May, and for the attorney exam, a 40% decrease. And uh, in terms of our numbers for the July bar exam, you'll hear uh, from Audrey later, but um, you'll see that there's a trend uh, in, in the reduction of the number of applicants. As for moral character extensions, we have a 70% decline. Some of this can be attributed to uh, the increase in uh, moral character extensions last year that stem from the provisional licensing program. As you recall, part of the requirement for the provisional licensing is that you had to have either a, a moral character application that was uh, in place or an approved application. And so um, in 2021, we experienced an influx of those applications. Uh, so uh, in terms of the multi-jurisdictional -jurisdic practice applications, and this includes registered in-house counsel, registered legal aid attorneys, and registered um, uh, military spouse attorneys, we have a 36% increase compared to uh, last year uh, around the same time. And then for the practical training of law students, a 20% decrease compared to April and May of 2021. Are there any questions related to the uh, key statistical indicators? To what uh, are we attributing the reduction of applicants for the general bar exam? You know, it, it's hard to predict. I mean, um, you know, part of it um, is, uh, it, you know, people perhaps, um, not being able to test in, in person. We had an increase in 2021 because people could take the exam from anywhere in the world. So we had um, a lot of uh, an increase in the number of people who applied as a result of that. Um, perhaps the fact that it's an in-person exam could be attributing to a lower registration rate. Uh, perhaps people also waiting to see what happens, uh, what results from the Blue Ribbon Commission um, to determine whether uh, they want to sit for this exam uh, or wait until the format changes, perhaps. Um, can't think of other uh, uh, issues. And in terms of the provisional licensing program as well, uh, that may have contributed. Um, so people who would have either um, uh, had to take the bar exam again um, were eligible to sit for this. So remember that um, the um, expanded pathway for the provisional licensing allowed people who took a, the bar exam between July 2015 and uh, February 2020, the ability to use a score, if they scored anything between a, a 1390, between the first read, second read, or in their scaled score, they could uh, work as provisionally licensed, not have to sit for the bar exam again, and uh, enter the workforce. So that uh, also probably led to a decline in the number of people uh, applying for the bar exam. That's a good point. Do we know how many people we have on that provisional list? 
Um, yeah, that's going to come up in one oh, of my okay. that's the next All item. Right. But uh, there was a total of about 2,000 that were eligible for um, the wow. PLL base based on that uh, category. Okay, wow. Yeah. Okay. All right, next slide, please. All right, so as many of you know, um, the provision, provisional licensing program has been extended to December uh, 31. Uh, 2022. And what that means is that applicants uh, will um, uh, are going to continue in, in uh, active roles in that and participate in the PLP. Um, so uh, it was extended for both the original program, that is the 2020 law school graduates, and those that I just mentioned that qualified based on bar exam scores uh, uh, between uh, 2015 and 2020. And the court uh, recognizes the contributions that um, PLLs are making in their chosen uh, fields. So this extension, again, is to provide additional time for these PLLs um, to allow them a seamless transition to full licensure. So the court order itself um, that was issued on May 26 does not change the program eligibility requirements, uh, nor the requirements for full licensure. So applicants are still required to meet the educational requirements. Uh, so in, remember what they included is if you had not passed the NPR, you had to complete the four hours of professional ethics training uh, of the 10 hour uh, of the 10 hours of new attorney training. And then applicants also um, overall were required to complete the 10 hours of new attorney training within the first year of participating as a PLL. And then if you fail to do that in that first year, um, that led to a termination in, in, in the program. Uh, applicants also an expanded pathway. They need to make sure that they're still tracking their hours and, uh, and submitting their time logs. Time logs are also still required from supervisors along with positive evaluations. Now, this extended timeline also allows more time for applicants to meet the, uh, any outstanding licensing requirements, such as uh, sitting and passing the MPRE. Uh, you need a score of 86 or above for that exam. Uh, getting a positive moral character determination because that is required for the licensing requirement and for 2020 law school graduates uh, they still need to pass the bar exam and in terms of our numbers of who remains in the program currently we have uh, 215 in the original program and 147 in the expanded pathway uh, next slide please so as you can see here, uh, here's another breakdown on our statistics. We have about 362 active PLLs. Um, and as you can see here, approximately uh, 11, a little over 1,100 uh, PLL participants have been admitted to the bar. Um, as uh, They're broken down here by those that were in the graduating cohort and then the expanded program. 600, those 616 uh, of those uh, graduates sat and passed the bar exam. And the 496 uh, are applicants in the PL, in the expanded program that uh, worked over 300 hours and received positive evaluations from their employees, uh, employers, as well as uh, having met all and satisfied all of the remaining licensing requirements. Uh, and then we have about uh, 99 uh, applicants uh, with either suspensions or terminations. And again, those happen as a result of either somebody's left a job, uh, did not meet all of the uh, rules. Um, and so uh, you could fall in either one of those categories. So the grand total of, of applicants who participated in the program overall is roughly about uh, 1,585 applicants participated um, in this program since it, its inception. And um, here's a breakdown of also the, of those, so of the 496 uh, that have moved from uh, the PLL and uh, become fully licensed, if you look at the next slide, these um, are those, uh, those PLLs licensed via the pathway. This is a breakdown of their race, ethnicity, and, rate, and ethnicity. So if you can see here, I'm sorry that this font's small, uh, about 214 of uh, the majority are white. Uh, followed by, um, I can't even see it, I'm so sorry, followed by uh, Hispanic Latino, 89, and um, Asian, 88. Uh, next slide, please. And in terms of school types, 
uh, the majority come from uh, ABA law schools, 178 from California ABA law schools, uh, 137 from California accredited law schools. Uh, other includes, um, there are 80, uh, and those are people from out of the country, out of state, um, uh, uh, perhaps attorneys. And then out of state ABAs, we have 71 applicants have been admitted uh, that come from uh, out of state ABAs law schools. Next slide, please. And in, term of, in terms of gender, uh, the larger proportion is a uh, female. All right, next slide, please. Okay, sorry, before we go on to this slide, I just wanna find out, um, do we have any questions about the PLL program? I, I want to comment. I just want to say that I think uh, putting this program together has been quite essential and I think successful in my opinion. I've seen uh, some PLL students with uh, local uh, nonprofits. I've seen some at the uh, public defender's office locally, and um, wow! I mean, they're putting them the they're they're putting them to work. I mean, they've got them down down in misdemeanors working in, in the courtrooms. I know that some of them now have been elevated to the felony level, and uh, they're doing a great job. And I and I think that that's uh, a tribute to this committee and uh, the innovativeness of the committee as well. And I think uh, I want to thank you for that, Amy. you and the staff. All right, thank you so much, David. Yes, we we received a lot of comments about um, you know the contributions that are being made around the state. So um, it is a very um, uh, a successful program. All right, any other comments before I hand it over to um, Audrey? Amy, uh, really quick, this is Kareem. We received a, um, a nice amount of public comment regarding this program, I think last month. Um, mm -hmm. Was there something that occurred at the Board of Trustees that would impact this program that you're aware of? Oh, well, remember the program was gonna uh, sun scheduled to sunset at the end of June. So uh, a lot of public comment um, was received about uh, applicants who had not uh, met all of the requirements or wanted more time, um, you know, perhaps to even sit for the upcoming uh, July bar exam. And so public comments were pouring in related to that. And, uh, and uh, uh, they happened here at the CBE meeting. They occurred at the board meeting in time for um, the, uh, that, um, created support uh, at the, in the, at, to the level of the Supreme Court who uh, issued that order on May 26 that expanded the program through December. So the, the program is expanding or not expanding, but extended? Yes, uh, I okay. just reported on that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, Audrey, now to you. Now to me, uh, good morning, everyone. So um, today is June 17th um, and the June first year law students exam is coming up very soon on June 28th, that's a Tuesday. Uh, today, if anyone signed up for the exam is listening, is the deadline for students to take their mock exams. Uh, we are administering this exam again, primarily remotely. Uh, we will have a small number of accommodated applicants and applicants with extenuating circumstances testing um, in the San Francisco area and the LA area. Um, as of right now today, um, when I check the numbers, we have 293 first year law students exam takers. Any questions? Okay, I'm gonna move on, I think, to the bar exam. Um, so we are going to administer another in-person bar exam, just like we did in February, um, the July 2022 California bar exam coming up at the end of July. Right now we have about 8,400 applicants who have submitted their applications by June 1st for the exam. We're moving through the eligibility of those applicants to sit the exam. Um, we will be uh, having test centers all around the state for in-person exams and uh, using hotel rooms for those who have accommodations. Um, I would like to refer everyone to the posted FAQs if there are any questions about the 
July exam and any of the changes. Um, and we are going to start starting today, sending out six weeks of Friday emails to applicants, um, also to all the deans of the law schools and administrators to make sure everyone knows what they need to do to prepare for the exam. Any questions? All right, um, well, moving right along. Um, I want to announce to everyone an upcoming uh, stakeholder meeting. So we have um, a forum scheduled for June 29th from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. We are in the midst of reviewing and revising the testing accommodations process for all of our exams. Um, so as part of that, we want to really listen to stakeholders, and that includes applicants, um, former applicants, um, all of you, anyone in the public, uh, anyone from the schools who might want to come and explain uh, what they might see as issues that they want resolved or how they might want processes to change in the future. And we really want to listen and record those uh, comments on June 29th so we can fold in um, that for our review of the change in process. So uh, please mark your calendars. It's 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. on June 29th. That's a Wednesday. You can come to either of the State Bar offices uh, to come in person to make comment, or it will be on Zoom. The Zoom will be um, third party closed captioned, and there will be ASL interpreters on that Zoom as well. So as uh, inclusive as possible, you can let me know um, if you have any other reasonable accommodation requests for that meeting. And it's really just an open forum. So uh, folks can come in and out to give comment. Um, they're welcome to stay the whole meeting time as well and hear other comments, but we're just here to listen and to record. Um, we can also accept through, uh, through that day any written public comments for those who can't make it and the meeting will be recorded and posted as well. Any questions? All right. Alex, um, we'll hand this back to you. And also, I just want to note that um, Judge Toriaba has joined um, our meeting. Yeah, thank you, Amy. I was just about to ask you a question. Um, I do see some more names. Um, and so I'd like to do another roll call. So, Mr. Angelos. Alex Chair, I'm sorry, Alex Lawrence. Here. Dr. Bolton. Here. Robert Brody. Here. Dr. Cow. Alex Chan. Here. James Efting. Here. Kareem Gungora. Here. Dolores Heisinger. Here. Judge Herman, Michael Aseri, Larry Kaplan, Paul Kramer, Esther Lynn, Bethany Peak, Vince Reyes. Here. Judge Toyalba. Uh, thank you. David Torres. Here. Dr. Wilkinson. Here. Here. Thank you. Okay, so I'd like to move on to the next item on our list, uh, open session examinations. And that would be a discussion of the Blue Ribbon Commission on the Future of the Bar Exam, Recommendations and Next Steps. I think Mr. Alex Chan is with us, but Ms. Esther Lynn is not. So I'll turn it over to you, Mr. Chan. I appreciate it. Thank you, Chair. Um, first and foremost, sorry for dressing inappropriately. I'm in the middle of a travel, um, so pardon me for the time being. Um, let me just give you a rundown as to what happened in the last meeting. Uh, the commission uh, continued with this discussion on the non-exam pathway to licensure and its framework. We had a couple of speakers um, at the meeting last time. Uh, one of them is the director of research at the University of Denver, who spoke on what it takes to design an effective supervised practice. Uh, one of the key design criteria that he recommends 
is the use of independent decision makers to make final licensure determination that would improve credibility and also allow for a change of supervisors where necessary. And on that front, he proposed certain criteria for supervisors, including that they must be licensed in California. They have to have a clean disciplinary records and, and they have to have at least three or more years practicing as a lawyer with at least two of those here in California and also with a focus on DEI or diversity, equity, and inclusion for these supervisors. In his view, training and support would also be key to ensure consistent assessment and also scoring um, in order to avoid implicit bias among many other things. Um, in essence, his proposal, uh, my understanding is it, it, it is tied, it, it ties feedback to competence and also encourages narrative feedback you know, between the supervisors and the applicants over some numerical ratings. Uh, and for candidates, as you can imagine, you know, they want transparency, so they have to know who will evaluate them, how they will be evaluated, and also what criteria will be used to determine their competency. And to that, to that end, that speaker recognizes that assessment will clearly evolve over time, and that formal evaluation will likely be more appropriate including regular evaluation and feedback from different stakeholders. So that's the first speaker. We also have another speaker who is a professor from the Ohio State University of School of Law, um, who spoke on her view as to the design parameters for an experimental, experimental education pathway for licensing. Uh, she proposed, interestingly, a 10-step framework. That really includes identifying knowledge and skills, and then match them to courses and client interactions, followed by keying in on the required courses. She also spoke on what she calls knowledge in action, things like drafting or writing or issue spotting or counseling or things of that nature, and also the courses that would promote that knowledge in action. And with that, she has proposed that the bar examiners assess the candidate's portfolio including the written work, the video perhaps, the learning plan, assessments, and their transcripts uh, to determine whether minimum competence has been met. She also recommends the use of certain rubrics uh, to help make that determination. Mm -hmm. And of course, to enforce consistency under her proposal, people including faculty, supervisors, and examiners will be required to go through training, to reduce, again, bias, and also to develop consensus on the minimum competence. And for grading, in her view, it's gonna be holistic in nature, and she recommends the use of a point system. And so with all of that, you know, design parameters in our back pocket, we had the NCBE come and present their version of the Sacramento guidelines for non-exam licensing alternative. Um, the takeaway is, is that, um, uh, psychometric considerations must be applied in the same way as the examination pathway. But there are really no substantive discussions on the concreteness or the exact parameters of the psychometrics that will be applied. So it, it's still very early in that stage, but it seems like NCB will take on the same approach that it has taken you know, for the exam pathway. So this basically sums up the last meeting <laughs> that the full commission had, um, and then we'll open up the floor for the committee, um, you know, to, to, and, you know, to raise any questions that I can help address. Um, but preface to that, I, I want to seek the CBE's guidance, and, and perhaps this is where everyone can give me their input on, on the next step. Uh, I do anticipate the full commission to be voting on the, this option specifically, whether it's a viable option. And so I think it's pertinent for the CBE to tell me, you know, or for at least for each individual member to tell me what you think as to whether this is an appropriate pathway, whether there's any alternatives or changes, modifications that you would like me to raise with the full commission. So with that, I'll pass the uh, mic back to you, uh, Mr. Chair. Well, uh, before we uh, move on, I want to open it up to the members to see if they can have any questions for Mr. Chan, any feedback? Yes, I, I have a question uh, for uh, Alex. 
uh, Alex, earlier in the meeting, uh, our chair, Alex, uh, talked about the uh, national conference and that there was an emphasis on diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion. And you also mentioned that. Are these, uh, in your opinion, are these separate policies going forward or is, or are, is this principle embedded in all of the uh, proposed uh, actions going forward? I can't speak on anything outside of the full commission, uh, but at least for the full commission, the idea is ensure DEI across the board from faculty, supervisors, and examiners. That's gonna be a key across the board. Again, that is really to tackle any implicit bias that could be inherent in the system, right? Mm -hmm. To make sure everything is fair, everything is graded consistently throughout. And of course, you know, when it comes to minimum competence, DEI would also be a key to ensure that we have a consensus as to what that means. And of course, Audrey, feel free to chime in if I'm saying anything that's... No, that's exactly right. Uh, the blue ribbon guiding principles, um, one, of, one of those tenets is about, um, um, you know, making sure that we have equity and fairness throughout the process. Great, no, that's, that's encouraging because, you know, it's such a popular topic, yet it's so hard to make it move uh, in a meaningful way. So, uh, you know, again, thank you for your work on this and for being a proponent of uh, DEI. Thanks, Mr. Reyes. Uh, uh, Mr. Chan, thank you for your report. I, I really appreciate you having there um, at the table for us. I have a question though. Um, I know you sat on a national, you were a runaway representative to a national group as well on the CBE. Do you, are you still serving on that one too? Uh, I'm no longer serving on that one. I think my, uh, my involvement is, is, is over as of last year. Okay. Um, so my question is, uh, um, the conversations, how do they, how do they reason how other jurisdictions, um, and this is because I went to the national committee of bar examiners, like other jurisdictions don't have as much, um, of hurdles to climb to become a licensed attorney. So like, so how did, how do the conversations, I guess, reason that um, there's not a similar program that should occur here. I think Wisconsin, I, I think you just graduate from law school and you become a licensed attorney. So, so how, did, how do you compare those type of jurisdictions or are those conversations being had? That's a really good question. I think, you know, we have different, different speakers uh, chiming in on different jurisdictions, including the University of New Hampshire, who has a really unique program. And also we have speakers who spoke about the, um, uh, uh, the, the, the jurisdictions in Oregon about what they do. But I think, you know, it's a mixed bag. I think we're still trying to understand what each jurisdiction is doing and, and in coming up with a, with a program that will fit, you know, under the scale that we have here in California. But I, I don't think there is a, you know, one size fits all solution here that would address, you know, what other jurisdictions are doing and what we're trying to do. Awesome. Thank you. I really appreciate you. Um, can I add just a, a couple of things? So, um, Kareem, you know, uh, uh, Wisconsin came to the Blue Ribbon Commission to do a presentation on diploma privilege. Um, New Hampshire, uh, the program that Alex mentioned, uh, the Daniel Webster program, uh, did a presentation for the BRC. So we've heard, and also Oregon came and did a presentation because they're embarking on a non-exam pathway. They designed, uh, designed a program uh, that uh, will um, allow for um, an, an, an alternative method of licensing. And so um, one of the you know, uh, things that stands out um, is the ability to, the scalability issue for California. Wisconsin has like three law schools, um, they're all ABA. And so the landscape is very different when you compare it to California. So you know, we look to those models, but building that in California has its uh, challenges given you know, um, how, what our educational uh, law school education system looks like in California, Given the given the volume of our applicants and um, you know uh, just uh, all of those considerations, we also heard from um, other organizations that um, provide, uh, for example, a, a, a supervised practice um, as part of like internship programs um, and students prepare even to sit for the bar exam uh, here in California. 
but uh, you know some of those require like the PLL program, um, you know, uh, partnerships with um, finding employers that can, are willing to work and, and pay applicants while supervising them at the same time. You know, it's something that we learned for the PLL program has been a challenge for applicants to find um, somebody who's willing to supervise and um, take them on and uh, take them under their wing. Um, also ensuring that uh, all of that happens consistently, you know, so that the supervision for one applicant looks like the supervision for someone else coming up with standards for that too. So all of these things are what the Blue Ribbon Commission is tackling. So, um, you know, looking to other jurisdictions is something that we've definitely done on that commission. Um, but, uh, you know, there's still a lot to uncover and a lot of challenges and issues to address for California. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Any comments or questions or feedback for Mr. Chan? Uh, I just have one, maybe more of a request, Mr. Chan. Like you mentioned, you know, a request from the group. Just want to emphasize that point that you're looking for feedback um, from the CD members. So uh, just remind the group sort of the you know, the frequency and like maybe key milestones coming that coming up um, as pertains to yours and Ms. Lynn's participation on the BRC. Uh, when's the next meeting? When like maybe the next sort of critical votes may be coming up, you know, that uh, a, a vote or a opinion that needs to be shared by you and Ms. Lynn uh, is necessary to represent this group. Do you mind just sort of sharing that with the group as a reminder? Yeah, I think the next meeting is going to be in July. And Audrey, do you have the exact dates? Um, yeah, we, um, we moved it uh, because of the holiday uh, to July 19th. Yeah, July 19th with the next meeting where the expectation is to vote on this non-exam pathway, uh, whether this would be a recommendation to the Supreme Court. Uh, that does not mean we are, um, ex you know, we have voted on the other alternative, which is the exam pathway. It, it, this is just a matter of whether we need to include that as one of the recommendations. Um, Certainly, this is a key milestone, um, and, and the, the committee will have to start weighing in on, you know, the pros and the cons. Whether it is it is fair, whether the the you know the, the state bar is ready to, to adopt this alternative if it does get approved by the Supreme Court. So there are a lot of stakes involved, and that's why I think you know this is an important time for the full committee, CBE, to give me your feedback, what your inclination is, whether this is something that you would. Um, you would recommend, encourage, um, or if you have, you're against it, you know, what would you like me to say and, and, and forward to the full commission at the next meeting? Thank you. Uh, Alex, thank you for that. Um, and uh, if I could, uh, can, I, can you please uh, kind of emphasize the results of the PLL program? I think the emphasis uh, for me is the uh, diversity impacts that we're seeing as a result of it. I know it's not uh, majority scale, but I think as a program and it's limited uh, time has has made some great strides. So I think that might be a good point of conversation to kind of help to the discussion you're having. Uh, I'll defer that to Amy because the commission isn't really focusing on the PLO on its own, but certainly we, we understand the objectives and those objectives have been incorporated as part of this alternative pathway. Um, but the PLO itself, and in isolation, it's not something that the full commission has considered. Well, um, it's a model that it's uh, that has been presented to um, the uh, Blue Ribbon Commission. So, uh, the same way that we uh, brought, uh, like I mentioned, uh, the Diploma Privilege Program, uh, the Daniel Webster Program, uh, the uh, different programs, for example, apprenticeship programs uh, uh, from Canada. Uh, four separate uh, jurisdictions in Canada came to present on that. We also presented on the PLP program. And so, um, you know, uh, we're offering uh, all of these uh, models uh, for, to help direct um, the Blue Ribbon Commission or, uh, you know, just have an assessment or um, uh, examples that they can um, derive their recommendations from. Yeah, Mr. Gagora, just to be clear, a lot of the underlying criteria are embodied or incorporated into some of the design parameters, things like the 10-step framework that I just talked about, uh, and also having the supervisors um, and providing feedback, that's also part of the, uh, the, uh, the, the alternative. So the, the objectives are incorporated in substance into the, the pathway option. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
Okay, great. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chan. Next item on the list is an update on the first year law students examination multiple choice exam content review project. Ms. Lisa Cummins. Everyone, good to see everybody. Um, yeah, so I am um, going to give you an update on the um, on the project that we're, we're having. So the State Bar announced uh, this project to review the content of the first year law students exam multiple choice portion um, We uh, in, in mid-April of 2022. So we sent uh, this um, information via email blast to all the law schools and there were several follow-up reminders that were also sent. Uh, there are two phases to this project. There was the uh, There is the content map review and the item review. Uh, volunteers were solicited, uh, applications were accepted until May the 2nd. Uh, we did receive 15 applications from all school types and all who applied were accepted. Uh, however, two reviewers did drop out for various reasons and so we ended up with 13 reviewers. Um, so we started with the content map review. Uh, we did hold two orientation sessions with two groups of the reviewers in May. Uh, and the reviewers were given homework to go through the three content maps. So if you recall, the first year law students exam only tests three subjects, contracts, criminal law, torts. Um, and so there were uh, domain um, areas of each of those contents uh, that were listed on this um, homework that they were supposed to do. Um, and so they were asked to provide their evaluations, including whether the domain and the subdomains are important indicator of first year law school performance and then the relative weights. All reviewers have returned their worksheets and our psych psychometricians are currently analyzing the results. So the next step is item re the item review phase. Staff is still working on the logistics for this review, which must take into account um, the consideration of exam security concerns because uh, at the um, reviewers will be looking at actual live um, uh, multiple choice questions. So for the first, uh, for the October, the upcoming October, well, not the upcoming, upcoming, but the next one, October 2022, first year law students exam, we will be pilot testing 25 new multiple choice items. They won't be scored. Um, and uh, uh, to, we still will be, um, the psychometricians believe that they will still be maintaining uh, the validity and the reliability of the exam overall, even with those um, unscored items. And uh, the uh, test is a 100 item total. So there are 75 um, um, older items, tested items, and then 25 new ones. Um, anyone who would like to comment, and this is a, a message to the public, on this topic is welcome to submit uh, public comment. And um, I do have, um, if anybody has in the on the committee has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them as well as um, Dr. Buckendall. Chad Buckendall is also um, is uh, here to answer any questions that might implicate psychometric um, issues. Anyone have any questions? Okay, well, that was my report. Great, thank you, Ms. Cummins. Thank you. Thanks, Chad, uh, for coming. <laughs> yes, thank you, Chad. <laughs> That uh, item C, approval of the report on the 2021 examination goals. I'll turn it over to Ms. Dolores Heisinger. Good morning again. <clears throat> so I'm filling in for Dr. Cowell this morning. Um, before you are the um, examination committee goals for um, 2022. Um, numbers one and three have been completed. The others are either ongoing or have specific dates for uh, completion. So unless you have any recommendations for additions at this point, I think we will entertain a motion to approve. This is Bravi. Uh, I'll move to uh, approve those goals uh, working with Dr. Cal. He's been a, a strong leader on that committee and uh, you know, I applaud the efforts of this committee. So I'll move to approve these goals. Thank you, Dolores. I'll second that. So it's been moved and seconded to approve the um, minutes, or the, I'm sorry, the report, the examination goals for 2022. Um, 
roll call vote, I guess. Okay. Alex Lawrence? Yes. Dr. Bolton? Yes. Robert Brody? Yes. James F. Ting? Yes. Kareem Gangora? Yes. Dolores Heisinger? Yes. Vince Reyes? Yes. Judge Tori Alba? <clears throat> Judge Toyalba. David Torres? Yes. Dr. Wilcoxon? Yes. Thank you. Um, question, do we need Judge Toyalba for the quorum? Yes, we do. Yes. Judge Tori Alba? Does it seem like Judge Tori Alba's available right now? So we will have to circle back and do this, uh, take this vote again. So Ms. Heisinger, I'm sorry, uh, we'll have to circle back to your agenda item. Uh, for now, I, let's continue on with more of the informational items on our agenda, and I'll reach out to uh, Judge Toriaba just to make sure she's still available to participate. I'm, I'm sending her. So the next item on the list, uh, moving on to uh, operations and management, I'd like to turn it over to Chair Mr. Epting and Ms. Tammy Campbell. Um, well, Ms. Tammy Campbell is out sick. Those of you in the LA conference room probably have realized that already um, because she's not sitting there with you. Uh, so uh, Jim and I are gonna soldier on <laughs> with the items. They're, they're all, they, these are all items to uh, vote um, for as well, but I'll, I'll start. Um, Jim will pick up on the goals in a bit. I'll start with the October uh, 2021 cost analysis for the first year. Does that sound all right? Yes. Okay, great. Um, okay, so I'm just opening it. Okay, so the October 2021 exam, um, in the in the odd years of delivering that first year law students exam, the um, facilities are combined with the legal specialist exam. And uh, those of you who've served on the CBE for a while probably realize that. So what we do is sort of have some economy of scale where we combine with that uh, specialty exam for attorneys who wanna be licensed in specialty areas. So we can pool some resources there with the first year exam in October. So like I reported on for the June upcoming exam for the first year, primarily the October 21 first year exam was delivered remotely, but we did have accommodated applicants and those with uh, extenuating circumstances coming in person to a, ho a hotel in the Bay Area and a hotel in the Los Angeles area. And we weren't able to use our offices because the numbers were larger because we also had accommodated applicants and um, extenuating circumstances with the legal specialist exam as well. So if you look at the year over year costs for October 21, and then we actually have it as November 2020, because you might remember in 2020, we had to shift the first year in the fall because we also shifted the bar exam, um, pandemic related reasons. So if you look year over year, the um, costs were definitely increased, but we had, um, we were using hotel space and not our own office space for the October 21 exam. And that was the primary reason for the increased costs. Um, does anyone have any questions? I, I just, is it with respect to the first year uh, exam as well as the specialty exams, would it be economically feasible for us to have that, have those exams uh, administered online as opposed to uh, in person? 
So they are, so this is the cost with them. Both of those exams were primarily administered online, but because uh, some um, subset of a population of accommodated applicants need to come um, in person. And we are also um, offering anyone who says I have extenuating circumstances. I'm worried about my internet connection. I um, don't have a quiet place to test. Anyone who writes in for those reasons also was able to come in person. Th those are the costs, a, the, a large reason why the costs um, increase because we have the facilities. So when you look at the total cost, it, it, when you look at the breakdown, we do pay obviously for the vendor, the online vendor that has a cost. And then it's a, a additional cost to have the remote proctoring the, the, through the webcam. And then uh, the facility costs and the proctoring costs for those hotels for just that smaller subset has a high cost. So pretty much it ends up being equal or push? It's, it, yeah, I mean, so I think that um, just the year over year costs are different because we also were using hotel space. So when we are able to administer a small group of test takers in our own offices, that obviously doesn't have that um, overhead cost of a facility. And that's kind of the difference I was trying to highlight between the November yeah. 20. Yeah, so we were actually at two hotels and you know, if any of you have been to conferences or you've looked at these cost analysis before that the hotels um, have a high cost. Yeah, that's a lot of money, that's why. Yeah. Well, and one caveat that I also want to point out is that um, we started using the state bar offices because for the most part, um, they were closed during the pandemic. Um, but now that we're all uh, coming and working out of our offices, um, there's less and less space available. So I think we're always going to need um, some uh, hotel rooms. I mean, not to the extent that um, or, or, or some testing facility sites um, doesn't necessarily have to be a hotel room. The point is that um, I think that, uh, yeah, we there's a greater demand for space, um, which means that um, we're going to have less available for us for a future um, first year law student exam. Um, and the one thing that's helpful is um, the, the testing population is smaller, um, but it doesn't um, negate the need for us to look for sp testing space. Thank you. Any other questions um, before we? have a motion and hopefully a vote. <laughs> I don't see. I, you know, oh, go ahead, Mr. Torres. She has not answered me. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not logging in. I got a uh, I'm freezing my, my computer closed. Uh, but I uh, moved to adopt the attachment 0300. Uh, move that the October 2021 first year lawsuit examination cost analysis be approved. I'll second the motion. This is Vince. Okay. Yeah, Alex Lord? Yes. Dr. Bolton? Yes. <laughs> Robert Brody? Yes. James Efting? Yes. Prim Gangora? Yes. Dolores Heisinger? Yes. Vince Reyes? Yes. <clears throat> Judge Tori Alba? David Torres? Yes. Dr. Wilcoxon? Yes. Judge Tori Alba? Yes. OK, thank you. Did you get a retroactive carries. yes? Yes, retroactive, yes. The motion Sorry. carries. <laughs> I, I'm, there's something going on with my my mute and unmute, but I, I'm, I'm working on it. Great. Uh, are you done, Mr. Angelus? The motion okay. carries. Thank you. Fantastic. Do you want to go back to vote on the goals for examinations or do you want me to continue with the next operations and management item? Uh, let's continue with the uh, next item of operations and management and then go back to the goals. Okay, um, so uh, continuing with cost, um, the next cost analysis was for the February 2022 California bar exam. 
Um, and so the year over year comparison here is um, difficult because it was completely different in modality. So February 21, we had primarily an online exam. Again, similar to how I just described with the first year, we did have accommodated applicants and um, those with extenuating circumstances coming to hotel rooms in 21, February 21. Um, but in February 2022, we had the whole uh, state with the large convention centers and all the testing accommodation hotel sites. So it's, um, it's not at all apples to apples in this comparison and the cost um, related costs were much higher. Um, something else to uh, point out about the cost were that we did have some, um, which some maybe one-time costs, we'll see if this uh, occurs again, but we had to use a vendor called Event Farm for the um, application that um, applicants used to uh, submit their proof of vaccination or negative COVID test. Um, and then we also use that vendor to help us um, with the queues at the test centers to check uh, people to see that they were able to come, that they were clear to come into the event. So we had some costs there that we're not going to anticipate for July. Um, we also, in terms of the, the cost differential, used a new vendor, uh, PSI, um, for 500 at the proctors. Uh, their recommendation, which we followed for all the proctors across the state, was to increase proctor pay, So, um, which makes sense, and, and we want to do that where it makes sense, but that obviously increasing the pay of the proctors um, did increase the costs. We also, um, again, because of COVID, we allowed a much longer timeline to withdraw with a full refund into January. So in terms of right timing our capacity, um, we uh, had booked centers, convention centers and hotels based on a capacity that we might have predicted out um, before people withdrew with full refunds. So our capacity percentage you'll see in the report was um, 69%. So we were we had booked more space than we ended up needing because we gave a longer time for folks to withdraw. So there was a lot of different um, increased costs uh, related to this exam, um, and that did obviously lend to a, a bottom line that was three around 3.5. Nope, sorry, 3.2 million 3 .2. for the exam. Wow. Yeah. And we're anticipating that in this, the upcoming administration as well. We'll, well we won't more. have, we, we are able to have all the, the deadline, normal deadlines for July. So there won't be that issue with giving folks a longer time for a full refund. And so like in terms of knowing, so I reported the numbers earlier, right? So we know the numbers as of June 1, and those are gonna you know be, except for people who may not be approved uh, because they're not eligible, we'll have a better sense of numbers for who's gonna come and test. Um, and then we won't have those costs associated with checking for proof of vaccination or a negative COVID test. So using that vendor and having all that uh, cost associated with that. But in terms of you know increasing proctor pay and having all the large convention centers and all the testing accommodation hotels, that will be the same. And I would say also the those facility costs have increased um, as well from the pan after the pandemic. The as well as gasoline, so. Yeah, right. Any other questions about the cost? Thank you. I will move the February 2022 California Bar Examination Cost Analysis be approved. I'll second, this is Ravi. You have a vote, please. Alex Lawrence. Yes. Dr. Bolton? Yes. Robert Brody? Yes. James Efting? Yes. Kareem Gangora? Yes. Dolores Heisinger? Yes. Vince Reyes? Yes. Judge Torrealba? Yes. David Torres? Yes. Dr. Wilcoxon? Yes. The motion carries. Thank you. The next, the next item on 
the list is recommendation to eliminate the five year timeline for validity of the passing bar exam score. Mr. Robert Brody, Mr. David Torres, and Ms. Hershkowitz. Um, this is a, Donna Hershkowitz is uh, uh, not available for the meeting uh, today. So I think David uh, and I can make a. Uh, yes. Sorry, uh, I had requested that we put this closer to the noon hour, if that's okay. I'm, I'm sorry, yeah. Director Robbie, but Donna uh, would like to be here and she'll be available oh. around that time. Is that okay with you, Robbie? Oh yeah, I apologize. I, 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 Donna had told me she would not be available, so I didn't mean to rush it. We certainly would welcome her. She did the, had the laboring oar here, so yeah. yes, thank you. Yeah, and I apologize. I know you had mentioned that. Uh, earlier, uh, and so just trying to keep timing. So closer to noon, we'll circle back to that one. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Absolutely. So next item on the list, approval of the report on the 2021-22 operation and management goals. Mr. Epting. Uh, yes. So the goals are set out uh, agenda item 0303. Uh, there are nine goals. They're pretty much consistent with what we've been doing in the past. The one difference is some of the items that are set on the goal for June of this year, 2022, may be put off uh, because Tammy's not around to talk about them. But generally, um, unless there's any other questions, uh, I think the goals are pretty self-explanatory. We just need a motion unless there are questions. Are there any questions from the group or comments? A motion? This is Robbie. I'll make a motion to uh, approve those goals. Thank you, James. Thank you, Robbie. I'll second. second that. Go ahead, George. Anybody vote, please? Alex Lawrence? Yes. Dr. Bolton? Yes. Robert Brody? Yes. James Efting? Yes. Kareem Gungora? Yes. Dolores Heisinger? Yes. Vince Reyes? Yes. Judge Tori Alba? David Torres? Yes. Dr. Wilcoxon? Yes. Uh, Judge Torialba? She's muted. Sorry, yes. Okay. Thank you. The motion carries. Great. Oh, um, let me just apologize because I, I have to do courtroom or I'm in the courtroom. I keep muting so that I'm not interfering with the staff and everybody else. So I, I apologize. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, so we're gonna move on to the next uh, agenda item, that being educational standards, uh, since the chair. Uh, Alex, uh, yeah. uh, I'm just gonna request that we back, back up to the uh, approval of the examination subcommittee goals, get that over with quickly and so that's not hanging. Sure, yeah, I know there's a number of items that we're gonna have to circle back to, so, but. I'll honor your request. So can we get approval? I'm sorry, for the goals. Go ahead, Dolores, Miss Heisinger. Great. Um, so we're voting to approve the 2022 examination subcommittee goals. It has been moved and seconded. And I believe the only thing we need is a roll call vote. Correct. Right. Okay. Alex Lawrence? Yes. Dr. Bolton? Yes. Robert Brody? Yes. James Efting? Yes. Kareem Gangora? Yes. Dolores Heisinger? Yes. Vince Reyes? Yes. Judge Tori Alba? Yes. David Torres? Yes. Dr. Wilcoxon? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. I have Robert Brody as um, first and David Torres as second, seconding. Correct. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Let's go into educational standards. Um, again, I mentioned the chair is not available, but I'm going to go to the vice chair. That being Dr. Wilkinson. Good morning. Thank you. Um, we'll start with agenda item 0400. Action on major change, change of name and act with acquiescence to non-JD programs, degrees in public administration, university of Laverne College. 
this is this is actually a little bit exciting to me. They are uh, proposing to merge with their College of Business and Public Administration to continue offering the public administration program and degrees that they were offering when the law school was ABA approved. Our staff is recommending that the committee approve the name change in acquiescence to the proposal because the law school appears to demonstrate the ability to carry out the program without detracting from its JD program. Also note, it also provides opportunity to enhance the program and which will benefit the students. Do I have any comments from a college representative? I do see uh, Kevin Marshall, the Dean recognized. Ezra, if you could uh, allow Dean Marshall to speak. Dean Marshall. Dean Marshall, you can unmute and speak. Hello, everybody, uh, and uh, let me do this. And thank you for taking this under consideration. I'm here for any questions that you might have, but essentially we are going to move the public administration, which has a doctorate program, a master's and a bachelor's degree that was housed and managed and administered under our College of Business to the College of Law. Um, just to give us a much more richer uh, possibilities in becoming a kind of a governmental center in our region. I think it's an excellent idea. I applaud you both for doing what you're doing in, uh, in an area of, of the state that really needs a program. And I know that uh, Laverne is a top-notch program. I've had an opportunity to speak to some of the professors in the past and uh, your, your diversity program is excellent as well. Thank you for doing this. I'll make a motion to approve. I'll second, this is Kareem. Move that the Committee of Bar Examiners receive and file the University of Laverne College of Law's application. Approve the name change of University of Laverne College of Law to University of Laverne College of Law and Government Policy and acquiesce to the immediate acquisition, absorption, and administration of the University of Laverne's public administration program currently housed at the University of Laverne's School of Business and Public Administration, which will offer the Bachelor of Science in Public Administration, the, ba the Master of Public Administration, and the Doctor of Public Administration, and the joint JD and PA. And furthermore, that the law school provide a summary of its progress as to the acquisition in its 2022 annual report. So Mr. Torres put up the motion. Mr. Gongora seconded. Can we get a vote, please? Yeah. Alex Lawrence? Yes. Dr. Bolton? Yes. Robert Brody? Yes. James Efting? Yes. Kareem Gongora? Yes. Dolores Heisinger? Yes. Vince Reyes? Yes. Judge Tori Alba? Yes. David Torres? Yes. Dr. Wilcoxon? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you. Next item, 0401, action on waiver of requirements to teach fixed facility classes, Western Sierra Law School, withdrawn at the law school's request. Next agenda item, 0402, action on progress report related to periodic inspection, San Francisco Law School. So San Francisco Law School was inspected in 2020. The committee directed San Francisco Law School to address several mandatory recommendations and suggested recommendations as soon as possible and to file progress reports each by May 15th and November 15th of 2021, each year until the law school was inspected again. The last report was timely uh, filed on November 21st and presented to the committee in March, 2022. And the last 
um, report was filed in May, 2022. The law school is up to date on its recommendations, reporting its progress every six months. Separately, the law school though is on probation due to their five-year minimum bar pass rate is below 40%. Um, this isn't really what we need to consider today. It's separate. So accepting the progress report and accepting the progress report as the inspection does not affect the probation of the NPR report. Does staff have any other thoughts on this? Uh, no other comments. Any discussion from committee? We do have the Dean present. I don't know if the Dean wishes to make a public comment. Thank you. I don't currently see any hands, so I believe you can proceed. Discussion from committee? Is there a motion? Mr. Chair, I'll move um, that the committee of bar examiners receive and file San Francisco Law School's May 2022 progress report and make a finding that the law school has sustained its compliance with the recommendations noted in the law school's inspection report. I'll second the motion. This is Vince. Okay, thank you. I'll take roll. Alex Lawrence? Yes. Dr. Bolton? Yes. Robert Brody? Yes. James Efting? Yes. Kareem Gungora? Yes. Dolores Heisinger? Yes. Vince Reyes? Yes. Judge Tori Alba? Yes. David Torres? Yes. Dr. Wilcoxon? Yes. The motion carries. Thank you. Dr. Wilcoxon, sorry to interrupt, but uh, we have a presentation set at 10.30 a.m. So if you're open to it, we're going to suspend right now uh, your committee's work or presentation of the items and take a break, having the group return at 10.30. Is that okay with you? That is fine. Thank you. Great. So everyone, uh, let's take... Uh, break and return at 10.30 a.m. and then we'll have a presentation on ethics school and client trust account school by OTC. Thank you.
Yeah, before it was just okay. Hey, welcome back, everyone. Oh, just give it another few seconds, and then we'll uh, take a roll call. Okay, uh, Los Angeles, can you take yeah. a roll call, please? Yes. Alex Lawrence? Here. Dr. Bolton? Here. Robert Brody? Here. James Efting? Here. Kareem Gangora? Here. Dolores Heisinger? Here. Vince Reyes? Here. Judge Torialba? As long as you turn your volume all over. Judge Torialba? David Torres? Here. Dr. Wilcoxon? Here. Thank you. Thank you. And so I'll now turn it over to Mr. Carlucci. Sorry, uh, I'm here. Great. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Joseph Carlucci. I am a senior trial counsel in the LA office of the Office of Chief Trial Counsel. Um, I want to first say good morning to all the committee members and, and more important, thank you all on behalf of the Office of Chief Trial Counsel uh, for inviting um, me, us, to uh, speak to you today about uh, State Bar um, Ethics School and Client Trust Accounting School. Um, I know my time is limited, so I'm gonna try to uh, give you a good overview uh, and also leave time uh, for some questions. So uh, I'm gonna get right into it um, if you don't mind. So I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. Okay, so hopefully you can all see this and if not, please let me know. Um, it's, not, it's not large enough. It's not large I'm enough. On my screen. Okay. Let's see what I can do. All of us are larger than your shared screen. I think. If Is you that... look at your view options, Dolores, um, you could change that. Okay. So, uh, yeah. You can double click on it and it will get bigger. Okay. Uh, for for the others, is it is it sufficiently? Yes. 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 It's okay. fine. Great. Thanks. Okay. So um, a couple of just uh, introductory notes to give you an idea about both of the classes. Uh, Ethics school is a six-hour class. Uh, CTA school or client trust accounting school is a three-hour class. Uh, both of the classes are offered on a monthly basis, and since the pandemic, we have been conducting these classes via Zoom only. Uh, there is no in-person attendance. Um, both of the classes are taught by two OCTC attorneys. Um, usually one is a senior attorney or a supervisor, and then also a co-teacher would be one of our deputy trial counsel, which would be a more junior attorney in our office. Um, and this is one of the ways that we go about teaching our instructors to teach the class by um, having them sort of co-teach a class before they then lead the class. Uh, MCLE credit is available to those who attend voluntarily. Um, and those who do attend our classes, State Bar Ethics School and CTA School, the vast majority uh, are those attorneys who have been disciplined or uh, are being required to attend the class um, as a result of some other sort of alternative disposition with the Office of Chief Trial Counsel flowing from an investigation. So most of the, the attorneys or the participants in the class, uh, both classes, are attorneys who have been either disciplined or involved in the disciplinary system. But the classes are open uh, as you know, to, to virtually everybody. And we do have attorneys who attend voluntarily. We do have, as you know, uh, applicants uh, for admission who are uh, attending uh, the classes as part of agreements with, with you all, okay? Um, uh, 
the class is not just, you know, an oral presentation. The, the participants in the classes do receive uh, quite a bit of, of, of resources. And so the first thing for ethics school participants is they're going to receive uh, a hard copy of, or an electronic, everything is going to be electronic, an electronic copy of the PowerPoint slides that we show. Um, I can give you sort of a quick... Um, Introduction to those. Okay, so these would be the uh, the PowerPoint slides that we use um, that go through the material. Um, the uh, instructors are going to be um, using an internal outline that is actually not shown um, to the um, sorry about that to the to the class. So there are PowerPoint slides that are shown to the class. And then there's also an internal outline that we use. Um, oops. Um, the um, participants are also provided with a copy of the Rules of Professional Conduct and Selected Rules or Statutes, which is a publication of the Office of Professional Competence. So it, it basically uh, includes all of the Rules of Professional Conduct, um, the relevant, the most relevant sections of the State Bar Act. Um, and select other rules such as pertinent rules uh, from the California Rules of Court that, that come up uh, as ethical issues in an attorney's practice. Um, we also provide them with what we call the Ethics School Workbook, uh, which we have independently, as our office, put together. It contains various forms, such as... Um, um, copies of or examples of attorney fee agreements, um, withdrawal letters, how to properly write a, a, a withdrawal letter when you're withdrawing from representation. There are copies of uh, various ethics opinions that are relevant to various stages of representation that come up frequently. Um, and also a digest of relevant published cases on discipline, whether those be from the Supreme Court or the State Bar Courts Review Department, which is also a, uh, a lawmaking uh, body um, with regard to um, ethics and professional misconduct. Uh, at the end of the class, the uh, ethics school uh, participants have to take a 20 uh, question true false exam. Um, for passage, they have to get 75% right, which if I, my math is correct, I believe it's 14 out of 20. Um, it's an open book exam. It even when we were in, in a in-person environment, it was an open book exam. Um, nothing very onerous, um, but again, just putting forth something to make sure uh, that the participants have, have been paying attention. Uh, passage of the exam is required to receive a certificate of completion for the class. So if one of the uh, requirements of discipline is uh, taking um, uh, ethics or client trust account school um, in order to get that certificate of completion to demonstrate compliance with that disciplinary com uh, condition, they're going to have to pass the test. Uh, if they don't, they, they technically have to retake the test. Um, most people uh, pass the test. It's, it's, it's a very, very rare occurrence uh, that a participant doesn't take the class. I'm sorry, doesn't pass the test. Uh, we also give them a, a, a class and instructor feedback form so they can provide us with feedback on, on how we're doing in terms of the subject matter that we're presenting uh, and as well as, as how the instructors were in terms of um, uh, their performance. The uh, state, uh, the client trust account uh, school participants uh, receive different material. Um, they also do receive a, a, a copy of our, the PowerPoint slides that we show to them. Um, they also receive the handbook on client trust accounting for California attorneys, which is another uh, publication of the Office of Professional Competence. And it is a, a wonderful resource. Um, it is a resource that even the attorneys in the Office of Chief Trial Counsel will refer to um, in the course of their investigations of uh, client trust account 
misconduct. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful resource that takes attorneys through um, every aspect of um, operating and maintaining and properly handling a client trust account um, from how to open one all the way to how to distribute client money properly and how to properly uh, account and keep proper records. Um, it not only contains you know, discussions of the rules, but it actually contains a lot of very helpful uh, sample forms that attorneys can use in terms of uh, ledgers and balance sheets. And, and, and it gives very good examples of, of how to um, reconcile an account, how to properly account for um, distributions and receipt of money. So it's a, it's a wonderful resource and it is available uh, to everybody on the State Bar public website on the ethics page. Um, our PowerPoint slides that we present, um, as well as the internal outline that our instructors use, tracks the, um, the same structure and, and flow of the Client Trust Accounting Handbook. Uh, so our, the presentation of our material during Client Trust Accounting School, um, again, does track with the handbook um, and we actually re refer to the handbook during the class. Uh, the examination um, for client trust accounting school is only 10 true or false qu uh, questions. And signs up on the old lady point. Yeah. Okay. Huh. Um, and 70% um, um, is uh, required for passage. And, and just like with ethics school, uh, passage of the exam is required to receive a certificate uh, of completion for the class. And there's also a class uh, instructor feedback form uh, that we distribute. Okay, so um, trying to give a brief, um, you know, uh, overview of the structure of ethics school. Again, it's a long class. It's, it's a full day, six hours. Um, but the class is essentially structured to take participants through the life cycle of a typical class and in, I'm sorry, a typical case and highlighting the rules and best practices that arise at key stages of, of a case. Um, and so for instance, we're gonna start right off the bat with how you obtain clients. Um, so we're gonna talk about advertising and solicitation rules. So we're gonna talk about ethical duties that arise for an attorney even before they have any clients. OK, um, then when those clients come in uh, for consultation and possible hire, we're going to talk about how we screen, how, how you should properly screen clients, uh, focusing on issues of conflicts, uh, the scope of services to be provided, uh, the clear terms of representation, which is a, is a hugely important issue um, for an effective and successful attorney-client relationship. Um, then we're gonna move on to the actual providing of legal services um, during the representation. Uh, and we're gonna discuss in, in detail um, issues of performance uh, and communication, which are by far the, the types of complaints that our office receives the most. Uh, we spend a great deal of time talking about what is competence uh, because competence is not limited to simply legal knowledge. It's much more broad than that, and it's important for attorneys to understand that. Um, in, in ethics school, we will spend some time on client trust account issues. So they will have an introduction. It's not gonna be nearly as uh, in depth and as focused as client trust accounting school, but we do spend some time talking about basic client trust accounting uh, issues and uh, responsibilities. Then we're going to move to the back end of the, uh, the, you know, the end of the relationship. We're going to talk about when the uh, attorney-client relationship is terminated, whether that be from the, the attorney who's, who's quitting or withdrawing, or if the client is firing the attorney, and talking about the duties that arise at termination, um, including things, uh, important concepts such as avoiding foreseeable prejudice to the client. And what does that mean in real life terms? Uh, we talk about the duty to refund unearned fees. 
uh, the return of the client file if that's requested. Then at the end of the class, we move on to some you know, sort of miscellaneous um, duties outside of the attorney-client relationship. So we talk about dishonesty or the duty of honesty. Uh, we talk about concepts of moral turpitude, which uh, honesty, moral turpitude, those are issues that can arise outside of the attorney-client relationship. They can arise in, in private life, okay? Uh, and, and we talk about uh, conviction proceedings, okay? So when attorneys are um, convicted of crimes, they're going, going to be su possibly subject to discipline based upon that conviction. And we discuss the types of, of, of crimes uh, that, that give rise to those cases. Um, and um, issues of discipline and, and, and things like that. Uh, we also fi finish off with the reporting obligations of the attorney. A very important um, statute in the Business and Professions Code is section 6068 subdivision, or subsection O, which sets forth all of the reporting duties of an attorney. So uh, to the state bar, certain events, some of which are well known such as sanctions over a $1,000, um, things like that, uh, uh, fraud judgments, um, convictions, discipline in another jurisdiction. So we go through all of the reporting duties. Um, and then we talk about duties to the state bar for especially with regard to disciplined attorneys, uh, the, the, the importance of complying with uh, probationary conditions if you are, um, have been disciplined. Um, compliance with Rule 9.20 of the California Rules of Court, which is a very important um, rule if imposed and, and can be a very serious violation uh, if, if it's not complied with. Um, so that's just a real nutshell of, of sort of the, the areas that we cover. Um, now, we, we really do try to avoid uh, just a dry recitation of the rules. Uh, and we try to avoid discussing the rules in a vacuum. And so the, the rules and the statutes provide the foundation for all of our discussion. Um, but we want to provide uh, the attorneys with um, more than just what the rules say. We want to provide them with the knowledge and the tools uh, to, to state out of the disciplinary system entirely, not to just avoid discipline. And, and, and for me personally, and I think for, for the attorneys in our office, this is a very important concept, okay? Because the idea here is that we want to not just tell you what the rules are, okay? And, and what you need to comply with to avoid discipline, but we wanna to talk to you about um, best practices and good practices that not only will help you avoid being disciplined at all, but it'll help you stay out of the disciplinary system entirely, which means not having complaints filed against you, okay? Um, because really the goal um, for the attorneys should be, you know, not to simply um, avoid being disciplined, but not to be in the disciplinary system. And to put it mildly, being the subject of a state bar investigation is a drag. Uh, it's time consuming, it can be expensive, it can cause a lot of anxiety. Uh, and even if you are not ultimately uh, disciplined or even have charges filed against you, it can be um, you know, a, a difficult process to go through. And, and so the goal is to have you know, a, a higher and higher percentage of our attorney population simply staying out of the disciplinary system by adopting best practices above and beyond the minimum ethical requirements so that they're not generating complaints, okay? Um, and so again, the rules and the statutes set the floor for the minimum expected professional conduct. And we encourage attorneys to strive for higher and better quality of conduct. And so we do this through various ways. We talk about the importance of memorialization uh, and documentation of what you do in your conversations, because so many of the complaints that we receive are, are based upon uh, disputes regarding communication 
what the expectations of the client was, what they believed the attorney was going to do versus what the attorney uh, it, believed their duties were. Uh, we talk about the importance of, especially during client screening, meeting personally with clients at the outset of the representation so that both parties have a clear and mutual understanding of the goal strategy and the possible outcomes. And this you know, is, is such an important concept for attorneys to, to, um, to understand and really to adopt. Because as you can see in the last bullet point, one of the ways in which our, our instructors um, convey these points to the class participants is, is through our experiences you know, with working and handling investigation, multiple, multiple investigations and seeing the same sorts of patterns uh, over and over. And so an experienced investigator or attorney in our office, um, you know, we can look at the, the, the beginning of the client attorney-client relationship and see what was discussed, um, see what sort of documentation um, was was created and 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 basically predict like i can tell that this is going to end badly there just was not a a good meeting of the minds there was not clear um a clear explanation to the client as to um what the attorney was going to do and this lack of communication this lack of understanding leads to misunderstandings bad feelings and possibly ultimately a state bar complaint and so we, we try to use at each stage um, of the outline, you know, of the representation, um, using the, the specific, talking about the specific rules, but also giving sort of um, examples that we have seen uh, in, a, in a general sense, not, not naming anybody specifically, obviously, but talking about those sorts of common um, um, scenarios that we see um, over and over that again, may not ultimately end in discipline, but are sufficient to um, generate complaints, okay? And then bring the attorney into the disciplinary system. Um, the goals of Client Trust Accounting School um, are, are, are more uh, refined and, and um, pinpointed. Um, here, we're talking about helping attorneys understand and fulfill their ethical obligations to clients whose money and property they hold in trust. Um, the purpose of the class is to educate attorneys about the rules governing client trust account duties and concepts behind client trust accounting, and to provide the attorneys with the basic information necessary to properly obtain, uh, operate and maintain the, their account and to properly account and distribute each client's money. Uh, and as I mentioned, we, we provide all of those additional resources, including the handbook on client trust accounting. Um, this class is, is um, again, very specific as to the rules regarding uh, client trust accounting. And, and in fact, you know, under the rules of professional conduct, it's simply one rule. It's rule 1.15 that, that, that deals with client trust accounting. But within that rule are so many subsections of, of, of various duties uh, that an attorney has um, that uh, th th there's just operating and maintaining a client trust account um, can be a very um, significant task for attorneys. And th this probably doesn't come as much surprise, but, you know, our, you know, anecdotal experience is that many attorneys are not very good at accounting. A lot of attorneys go to law school because they don't like uh, numbers and math. Um, and so they have that um, uh, to face. The other thing about client trust accounting is that it takes time. Uh, to do it properly takes significant time. Time that is um, a being taken away from your law practice. And we recognize that, but we also recognize that if an attorney is going to have uh, a client trust account and is going to have the type of practice that requires a client trust account, they are going to have to um, take the time to do it properly. Um, 
it's it's very very easy to violate the client trust accounting rules even if you don't intend to okay um and and under our rules uh to be a violation we don't have to show an intent okay um, the attorney doesn't have to intend to violate the rules um and and so the the it, it, it's very easy to establish a, a violation of the rules, even where the attorney is, is essentially acting in good faith, but is just making mistakes or uh, just lacks the, the, the knowledge uh, of how to operate the account. Um, one of the other things that we, we really do stress in client trust accounting school is personal operation and maintenance of the account. Um, Client trust accounting rules are non-delegable. As we say, you, you delegate to at your peril. Many attorneys do delegate to staff members um, or to accountants. And if things go wrong and things are not handled properly, uh, the attorney is going to be held uh, liable or held to account uh, in, a, in a disciplinary matter for the mistakes or wrongdoing of, of those to whom they have delegated. Um, and so um, we, we, we really do stress the importance of um, personally um, ma maintaining and operating the account and coming up to speed uh, and learning all the various rules. Because again, it is very easy to violate um, the, the rules if you are not careful, if you are not doing good accounting, if you are careless um, and neglectful, uh, it is quite easy to to wind up with uh, violations of um, the client trust accounting rules. Uh, the client trust accounting handbook that we give again uh, provides um, sample and model documents in terms of setting up ledgers and all of the proper record keeping um, that is in, that is required. Um, one of the most you know one of the most commonly violated rules within the client trust accounting rule is a failure of, of the attorney to maintain the proper uh, the required records okay the individual ledger for each client the monthly reconciliations what have you and so we spend a lot of time talking with the attorneys or or the attendant uh, the the participants at the class about what records they have to um um, keep and maintain and, and for how long they need to. Um, it's very, you know, it's quite frequent in the course of our investigations that we request those records from the attorney um, that they are required to keep under the rule uh, and they simply don't have them or they have incomplete records. That in and of itself is a violation. Um, but even more than that, the failure to, to properly maintain those records can lead to um, larger or more serious misconduct, such as a misappropriation of funds. And, and so this is what we're hoping to um, help the attorneys avoid, okay? Um, that, that's all I have. I can show you the, the actual resources um, that we uh, use in the class if you'd like, um, or if there are any specific questions, um, I can answer them. Um, but I wanted to try to avoid going through um, all the, the various rules, but I can certainly show you and I have handy, uh, you know, our PowerPoint slides for ethics school, client trust accounting school and, and those various resources if, uh, if you care to see those or uh, have any questions. Thank you, Ms. Scarlucci. I have a general question. Uh, you mentioned you know, using, uh, having Zoom classes. I'm just curious uh, for the time that those have been offered. I'm sure you've seen maybe some trends or, you know, in terms of attendance participation, anything that's sort of top of mind as you kind of keep getting uh, feedback and think about using that as a long-term type of resource? Uh, yeah, it's an excellent question. And it has been almost sort of like a, a you know, almost like a sociological um, experience. Uh, you know, when we first started doing it, um, one, we encountered people who had, you know, technological difficulties with it. Um, uh, as time has gone on, those have almost entirely um, disappeared. 
Uh, I think most people now are, are very familiar with Zoom. Um, the other thing that uh, I, I can say that we have noticed is that at the beginning, the level of participation um, was um, dramatically decreased from in the, the particip level of participation that we had in person. Um, but again, that has also evolved. Um, and it's much more interactive now. And I dare say that it's almost more interactive than it was uh, in person. Um, so it's, it's been a positive development. The other thing that I, is kind of off the, uh, a little bit off topic from your question, the other thing that is good about the virtual platform is that we, we sometimes have attorneys who reside out of state or a long distance from uh, you know, downtown LA or downtown San Francisco, where the classes are offered in person, um, offering the virtual platform now makes the ability to attend the class so much easier. Um, especially if you're if you you know are a long way, you don't have to make uh, the trek into you know downtown areas and, and pay for parking. Um, with out of state attorneys, we used to you know have we wouldn't even have them attend either class we would have them instead uh, do like six hours of mcle um, which was not preferable but now with the virtual platform we can um if you're out of state you can attend the class from anywhere um and uh we no longer have these sort of geographical uh distinctions saying okay this class is only offered in san francisco or la so um overall i would say that the virtual platform is has been um, uh, more beneficial, and I think um, people people prefer it. Is there are still some drawbacks? Okay, that we're still working on. Um, you know, people can turn off their screens, and it's hard to um, you know monitor what the person is doing as opposed to when they're in person in a class, and we can see them. Um, so th that's a drawback. Um, I will also, if I, I know it's a long answer, but it's an interesting question. Um, it seems as though, in, if you talk to any of our attorneys, every ethics or client trust accounting school, there seems to be one or two people there who are just very resentful that they have to be there, that this, that, that, that's, this is being imposed on them. And they're gonna do their best to, um, disrupt the class um and we've had times where we've had to actually call security and have them removed um we see a lot less of that on the virtual platform um and we do have the ability to to keep them muted and things like that so it's given us some additional control over the class so thank you for the question though i hope that answers it yes thank you mm -hmm. are there any other comments or uh, questions uh, mr chair i have a comment uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Carlucci, and, and to also uh, Tara for uh, setting this up. Uh, as you know, um, uh, this committee and our, our subcommittee of moral character often has to uh, send uh, folks your way. And uh, you've just described maybe, you know, the uh, some of the people we may have sent to you from, our, from my own experience in dealing with some of the people and, and some of the uh, uh, hearings that we've had to uh, conduct. But I, I think uh, I, I'm a non-attorney public member, and I, so I think that this kind of knowledge uh, helps a lot in terms of uh, our understanding of the uh, kind of the code of ethics, if you will, for attorneys to have and the standards that they have to have so that when we do send people to these uh, remedial types of classes, uh, yours and LEP, we have a much deeper understanding of uh, uh, how this may help uh, uh, an individual uh, get back on track. So thank you for your presentation. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. It looks like Dolores has a question. James Bolton has a comment. It was an excellent presentation on the goals and the subject. However, I did not see a list of course objectives, and that's very important. <laughs> Have you defined the objectives of the course? Um, uh, you know, I think I, to the extent that we we put them in in, um, in the goals uh, again, the idea I think the the, the objective of the, the course is to 
Uh, and perhaps we do need to be more clear about and, and uh, explicit in stating what those objectives are. Um, but again, from, from my experience, the, the objective of the course is again, to give attorneys um, tools and, and knowledge using real life examples that we have seen about um, the, 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 how to avoid, again, how to, how to not, I don't wanna say avoid because it sounds as though it's nefarious, but how to adopt practices Again, that that not only will um, that not only are compliant with the rules of professional conduct, but go so far beyond that as to um, again keep the attorney out of the disciplinary system. The fact of the matter is, is that, and everybody knows this, our office has more you know, <laughs> enough work, um, and and our objective is to is not to create more work. It's not to to discipline attorneys. Um, especially through these classes, our, our job is to educate um, through um, discussing those common pitfalls um, that attorneys fall into over and over again and may not realize it. Um, I mean, I can give you some examples, but I know your question is, is specific as to um, the objectives of the class. I can't say that we have any ex explicit <laughs> objectives, but... Uh, the point is is extremely well taken, and it is something that I will discuss uh, with our management group about making clear um, in our materials and to the class members. There is a difference in goals and objectives, and what you just told us is a very excellent example of goals. I'm referring to specific objectives. In other words, what will the student be able to do? What are the skills you'll learn specifically in behavioral objectives? Okay, that's, it's, it's an excellent point. And, and I, I, I can't say that our, our I, I, can't tell, I can't tell you that we have um, accomplished that, or I mean, we, we, I, I'm sure we do that, but we need to express it better. And, and the point again is what, very well taken. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Ms. Heisinger? Uh, yes. Um, my comments are a follow-up to, to Vince's about moral character. Um, when we have um, moral character applicants that um, could benefit from uh, more guidance in the ethics department, um, sometimes we're torn about whether to send them to ethics school only or whether to send them to ethics school and on top of that require additional uh, MCLE classes from them. Um, and I know it's an, uh, an individual thing, it depends on, on the individual, but just uh, generally, would you say that um, the class that you provide is is robust enough, sufficient enough that we shouldn't be adding additional hours uh, uh, beyond that, or uh, because you know we we don't we can't specify which specific MCLE classes they should take, except that in the general area of ethics. So, um, could you shed a little bit of light on that for us? Yeah, I, I, I don't know that I am, uh, I, I would have the experience to tell you by any means not to suggest additional MCLE. Um, I, 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 I'm not going to tell you um, that what we offer in the six hour ethics school class is sufficient for everybody. It certainly may not. What I can tell you about the class is that um, for, for many of the attorneys who attend the class, it serves as a sort of a wake-up call to them. Um, and they, they hear things that um, they may not have considered. Uh, and, and, and they also hear from um, others who have been disciplined. And, and so uh, it, 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 it is a... It, I, I find it to be a, a very robust class 
and, and but that's personally based upon my experience coming out of law school and, and taking an ethics class. It was very difficult for me to have any sort of context not having practiced law. Uh, all of these rules are sort of discussed in a, not in a vacuum, but for someone who has never actually practiced law, it can be a little bit difficult to um, conceptualize how these, these, how these rules would arise. I mean, you learn the rule, well, I have to perform services with competence. Well, everybody knows that. Well, every, you know, I have a duty to communicate. Well, everybody knows that. But how did, how did these, how these attorneys actually wind up violating these rules um, and giving real life examples? Uh, attorneys very rarely set out to commit misconduct in a case, but it occurs. And in the class, we talk about those circumstances that lead to those violations and, and sort of send up those and, and, and talk about those red flags, okay? That these are things that are going to um, potentially lead to discipline, lead to a complaint. And so there is sort of a, um, you know, again, I said wake up call, but there's sort of, you know, a, a, a discussion of sort of alarming situations. Again, not, you know, people who are just flat out dishonest, but people who in good faith um, were thought they were doing their best, but, you know, slipped below the minimum um, expectations. And so, you know, just for an example, if I may, um, with regard to competence, you know, we talked about taking cases, you know, Competence is more than knowledge and skill. Are you physically competent? Are you mentally competent? Are there things going on in your life that tell you that you probably shouldn't take this case? Because if you have issues that are affecting your ability to practice, I'm going through a very bitter divorce. I can't focus on my work. Things are falling through the cracks. Okay. Um, it, that's not going to be a defense to a failure to perform. That's not going to be a defense to a failure to communicate. And so we talk about, you know, these, these sorts of situations where, again, people who, who are, are ethical uh, and are trying their best, nevertheless, um, fall into these sort of pitfalls. And so I do think the course is, is robust in providing these sorts of real life examples of, of, of people who commit misconduct without sort of any devious intent. And, and it still leads to client harm. And just to finish my, my response, I know it's long. Um, the, the last time I taught the class in person, which was pre-pandemic and the end of 2019, one of our regular respondents counsel who were, um, attended the class and came up to me and said, you know, Joe, I think every attorney in California should take this class. It, it is sort of bracing, okay? The things that are discussed, um, the examples that we go over, the ones that the participants uh, volunteer during the class. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, that, that helps. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a, a quick question. Mm -hmm. Yes, a, a question and also a suggestion. So. Um, it was very helpful to hear um, about the content of the course because I was curious about um, the referrals that are made from admissions, like uh, how many, how much background information you have on uh, the applicants that are coming in. Um, and initially I had that question because I thought how much of the um, content of the curriculum is uh, tailored around, you know, um, the issue that brought this person to ethics school or to a uh, client trust school altogether, but now that you've dispelled what the content is, it sounds like you have one basic course that covers uh, just about uh, a lot of various scenarios. Um, but we have like, for example, um, a, you know, they're like uh, patterns, like, you know, we have a lot of uh, UPL, um, uh, potential UPL that happens as well as, um, you know, uh, uh, the finance, uh, you know, uh, finan financial issues or um, potential financial damage, right, that's been caused by some of these applicants. And so um, I think one of the things that would be helpful um, is you mentioned that you had the PowerPoints um, for the courses. 
I'm wondering if you could share that um, via, you know, Tara with, with our committee, because we could include that in material that we provide to the committee. So as they uh, assess, um, you know, potential sanctions um, or uh, conditions as part of the moral character determination, uh, they would have a better sense of, you know, every uh, what what is included. It gets to a little bit of Dolores's question too, is um, what is a full content of that? And I think the PowerPoints might help in the event that they also want to add like MCLE referrals as well. So, um, you know, I, I my original question was answered when you mm -hmm. met, uh, presented on the content, but I think um, my suggestion is um, perhaps that you make that material available and we'll um, add it to material that we send out to uh, on as part of our orientation, also a material to the committee of bar examiners. Yeah, I, 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 I will, you know, discuss that with management, but I don't think that would be a problem at all. Okay. Yeah, uh, I, I, I don't want to speak out of turn, but um, I, I think that our office would be uh, certainly probably willing to share that information with with the committee. Okay. Yeah, and I will tell you that again, we do not know the background of any of. Uh, the the applicants who, are, who we just know they're an applicant. We don't we don't know any of the reasons why um, they are being asked to attend. So when when you fill out the registration form, you have to say whether you know you're an attorney, disciplined attorney, applicant to the state bar. Beyond that, we have no information. Okay, good to yeah. know. Thank mm -hmm. you. Sure. Thank you. Are there any more questions or comments for Mr. Carlucci? I don't think I see any. Well, thank you again. Yes, thank you very much, everybody, for 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 having uh, for having me. And again, the Office of Chief Trial Counsel really appreciates the op appreciates the opportunity to uh, present this uh, material to you. And if you have any other questions, you know uh, about the classes, uh, I can obviously be reached through Tara. So, okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Reyes. Uh, since we are on moral character. Do you mind if we finish up in the open session item B, approval of the report on the 2021-22 character goals? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, hopefully you have that in front of you. And as you can see, we're uh, halfway through the year and uh, we have accomplished uh, everything we set out to do, uh, including today, which was a very good presentation. And we intend to do more of these presentations in the future. Uh, we had one a few meetings ago with uh, David doing uh, one on bias. And I think there might be a part two of that coming up. I'm not sure, but we do have uh, more coming up. And then of course our bread and butter, which is uh, doing the hearings and then presenting that to this group for uh, their final approval. Uh, so that's, that's about it on the, our goal. So I'm looking for a motion to move the report be approved. So moved. I will move that the report on the 2021-2022 moral character goals be approved. Thank you. Robbie, I'll second. second. Thank you. Robbie. This is Robbie, I'll second. Thank you. So uh, Ezra, can we uh, call a roll on this one? Alex Lawrence? Yes. Robert Brody? Yes. James Efting? Yes. Kareem Gangora? Yes. Dolores Heisinger? Yes. Vince Reyes? Yes. Judge Tori Alba? Yes. David Torres? Yes. Dr. Wilcoxon? Yes. And the motion carries. You did not call James Bolton. Oops. Oh, I apologize. Uh, Dr. Bolton? Yes. Thank you, Dr. Bolton. Uh, back to you, Chair. Thank you, and uh, appreciate everybody being flexible, you know, with us uh, jumping around a little bit. Uh, but I would like to return to the operations and management item C, recommendation to eliminate five-year timeline for validity of passing bar exam score. I'm going to turn this over to Mr. Brody, Mr. Torres, and Ms. Hershkowitz. And. Donna, I I understand you're here. Yes, I'm I'm here and I'm ready to start. If if you yes, are thank you. Um, good good afternoon, everyone. Um, so 
You will probably recall that at your last committee meeting, um, staff had sought your feedback on a conceptual proposal to eliminate the five-year expiration date on a passing bar examination score. The committee responded positively to that conceptual proposal. And so at, uh, at our, my request, I had some volunteers, uh, David Torres and Robbie Brody, who volunteered to participate with me in uh, working up a proposal for your consideration. What you have in front of you today is a recommendation um, that the Committee of Bar Examiners proposed to the State Bar Board of Trustees to circulate for public comment rule changes that would in fact eliminate that five-year expiration date on a passing bar examination score. Currently, Rule 4.17 of the State Bar Rules require that within five years of the last day of the bar exam that you passed, applicants must meet all requirements for admission and uh, for admission and get certified to the Supreme Court. Uh, I'm sorry, show, applicants are required to meet all requirements for admission to get certified to the Supreme Court and must get sworn in. The agenda item goes into um, some uh, fairly specific great detail. Um, so I'm not gonna repeat all of that information here. Um, I uh, trust that you all have, uh, have read the item thoroughly. Um, but I just wanted to highlight a couple of points. Um, this committee over the years has seen a number of individuals seeking an extension of the five-year time limit um, in, with regard to both of those scenarios, either needing an extension in order to meet all of the requirements necessary um, to uh, satisfy, them, uh, satisfy the admissions requirements. Most notably, that would be the requirement uh, of passing, uh, getting a positive moral character determination um, uh, or um, or committee member or applicants who have not met all the who have met all the requirements, but in fact did not get sworn in. Um, with regard to the former, um, the failure to oftentimes um, uh, get the moral character um, positive determination within that five year period, um, often what we've seen is simply that there was an insufficient time to conclude the process within five years of passing the bar examination. This is not a scenario necessarily where people had a negative moral character determination, um, but rather um, that they, they simply um, for you know, a number of years, they didn't feel like they needed to be sworn into the bar. They lived in a different state. They had a job that didn't require a license. And frankly, they didn't want the extra expense of, um, uh, paying for bar licensure, and so they didn't proceed to get their license. Um, and this is, in fact, how the situation came to us that we are bringing to you all. Um, an applicant passed the bar exam, but didn't need their license, was working in a job that did not require licensure, um, so didn't file their application for a determination of, of moral character. As the five-year deadline was approaching, they filed they did file the application, um, but due to the need to get paperwork from another state, the um, moral character determination took about four to five months to process. Um, and it was approved uh, It was approved just ever so shortly after the expiration of the five-year period. So um, as I mentioned, I believe at the last committee meeting, um, staff had took, a, take, take, took the opportunity to take a look at our internal processes to figure out what happened with regard to this particular applicant? Um, did uh, state bar um, did uh, issues on the state bar side contribute to the fi five year time period passing um, before they were able to get their moral character determination? Um, did the staff and then ultimately the committee appropriately uh, follow their procedures in denying the request for extension? <clears throat> ultimately. Um, although staff's analysis was that everything seemed to have been done properly, um, what we determined was that was not particularly relevant. Um, we took a step back and asked how the five-year limitation was in fact furthering pu public protection, why it was necessary. And we concluded that it was not. Um, so what you have in front of you is the proposal that was put together by David and Robbie and myself to eliminate the five-year rule as unnecessary in furthering the state bar's public protection mission. We I see that it really is simply a bar to entry to the, entry to the profession, and therefore we recommend that it be eliminated. Um, you'll see in the agenda That's item several, 
several examples of attorneys who were sworn in timely um, to, just to help draw your attention to the inconsistency in how we treat unlicensed attorneys in, um, in the admissions context with how we treat currently licensed attorneys. Um, and as a result, sort of looking through those scenarios and looking at the rules and what, uh, what the purpose of the rule is, um, ultimately, the, uh, Robbie and David and myself concluded that the same rationale that justifies allowing attorneys to switch areas of the law that allows inactive attorneys to become active um, without having to take another bar exam argues for the removal of the five-year window in which a person must get sworn in after having successfully passed the bar exam. Um, you'll see in attachment A to the agenda item, a, um, a red line of show, showing the changes of uh, changes to rule 4.17 and uh, conforming changes that are needed uh, to be made to other rules, um, as well as um, addressing an issue that was raised at the last committee meeting about uh, retroactivity and providing a period of retroactivity for this rule change, such that anybody whose five-year expiration period fell during the pandemic um, would be able um, to um, take advantage of this new, new proposal to, for the rules. And with that, um, David and Robbie and I are happy to take any questions. Uh, actually, before I get there, David and Robbie, did you want to add anything? No, I, I just, you know, uh, what I said that day that we uh, discussed this issue, that a lot of times we go into uh, these discussions with respect to folks who haven't uh, sworn in, just with a lot of concern. Some of us have always believed that, that it wasn't fair, uh, but you know, a lot of us had to follow the rules. And I think that this is, a, uh, is an, an excellent way to approach this. I, I only believe that uh, this is gonna be an excellent uh, uh, change to to the rules and I think that I think we all should all be pleased about it because of, of what it's going to do but thank you very much for your time Donna you did an excellent job on this thank you yeah this is Robbie I you know I just want to echo and you know Donna's been very uh nice to uh to include me and uh, David but she and her staff really uh did did the work on this and you know in my five years on the committee of bar examiners this has been a tough part of every meeting when it comes up where we have an applicant who has missed the five-year deadline for lots of reasons. Maybe they have followed a spouse to another state and didn't think they need to be practicing illness, injury, all kinds of things. And our committee has been very, very dedicated in reviewing these. And we've usually been split. Part of us says we need to apply the rule fairly to all the five-year rule. The other part of us says this is an extraordinary hardship where we wish we could accommodate this applicant. Well, this solves the problem because now all applicants will be accommodated once you have been ready to be sworn in, which is to say you've passed the bar and you have a positive moral character. You, there is no uh, time limit on your ability when you are ready to be sworn in and become either a member of the bar or an inactive member of the bar. So for those of us on the committee of bar examiners and members of the public, I think this is a change, wow, that we can all be proud of. It really levels the playing field for our applicants for, for whatever reason. And all of us on this committee have heard a variety of compelling reasons for a delay and now those applicants are going to be accommodated. No more retaking the bar exam. Uh, so I, again, Donna and your staff who put this together in the space of just from our last meeting. So I'm, uh, I, I'm proud of this and uh, uh, I will make the motion unless there's any other comments. I, I have a, a, I have a, a question. I have a comment to question. Will there be a retroactive policy? Yes, Dr. Bolton, it's going to be retroactive to 2015. Is that is that right, Donna? Uh, <clears throat> yes. So in uh, so it specifically says that it applies um, for uh, uh, any bar exam that was administered on or after July 2015. Thank you. I, I had a question. Uh, I uh, I 
appreciate your work and I, I like the uh, direction, absolutely. It just makes it more crystal clear when we have to make these decisions. But I, I have, and, I, and I like the examples, but I, I just have a process question. I, I didn't quite get it first time reading it. So somebody uh, didn't practice for 10, 20 years for whatever reason. Uh, so now they you know, want to uh, become a member of the bar. Do they uh, start the process over again for moral character? And, and at what point? Because a lot can happen in, in a person's career in uh, 10, 20 years. Sure. Yeah. So, so, so the answer is no. So, um, and, and, you know, and, and there's so many different scenarios, right? So I've never traditionally practiced as people think, think of that, right? I've been a lawyer since 1994, but I've never gone to court. I've never, I've never practiced in that, in that sense. Um, I, um, I could, um, I could decide tomorrow that I want to start practicing. Um, the, because I am subject as an attorney to the, um, jurisdiction of the office of chief trial counsel. And if I sort of were to do anything, um, then I would come under their jurisdiction. But the only time that we are, when we certify somebody to the Supreme Court as having met all the requirements, passing the bar, having a positive moral character, not having a child or family support obligation owing, um, that's, uh, that is the last time that we've checked the, the quote unquote moral character of somebody who then gets sworn in um, and becomes licensed. We are, we are otherwise determining their moral character on a daily basis, if you will, if they're practicing law. Um, if they are not practicing law, but they went inactive, um, then their, their experiences may not have come before, um, before the bar at all. And we won't know until they start, they start practicing and if something were to happen, but there is no, um, there's no further check on their moral character once they switch from inactive to active. And that really was sort of, um, again, sort of the scenarios that we put in there were really looking at the differences between people who remain active and don't practice, people who go inactive um, for, for a number of years, and people who, um, like the people that you all see, who have passed the bar exam, uh, have passed moral character, and just haven't gotten sworn in. And we just don't, did not see any, any real difference that justified treating those in your jurisdiction differently than people in the jurisdiction of the Office of Chief Trial Counsel. So if a person decided they didn't, they, they passed the bar, um, maybe they practiced or maybe not practiced, but they went into a different profession, say accounting, and they had problems that would be similar to like client trust or they mismanaged funds or something, whether they intended to or not. So that that's not going to show up at all. Um, so David, maybe you can help me out here. I, I, I thought we still get updates from other licensing agencies. Yeah, that, that's one of the things. It's not something where you've been out that's a whole idea of uh, commencing the, uh, uh, the process of going on a background check because we need to know whether or not that person served some time in prison or has been yeah. arrested for very other, other things. So the moral character is what's important. That's what triggers it. And, and so that that's the number one thing. We need to find out what happened over the time period that they uh, passed the bar, but they didn't begin practicing now that they have that uh, interest, what has happened within that period? Okay, that that's kind of, thank you, Dave. That's kind of the clarification I was looking for. So, right. still, so if they were practicing in New Jersey and, and they were disciplined because of some nefarious act, we would need to know about that. Yeah. Okay. Great. But, no, that answers my question, and I'm 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 all for getting rid of that time limit. And I do want to yeah. I do want to say that this is something that. You'll be seeing, I'm assuming you'll be seeing, um, other rules come before you under the same kind of um, uh, circumstance where staff are taking the opportunity to stay, take a step back and not simply 
wordsmith the rules where we think there could be greater clarity, but take a step back and say, does this further public protection? Is this necessary um, to ensure that we are protecting the public or is this simply a bar to admission to the profession? Um, we are taking that sort of look with fresh eyes at the rules and should we come, come across others that it's sort of in the same vein as this one, just don't seem like, although at one time they may have been absolutely necessary to further protect public protection, they just don't seem that way anymore. And so you may be seeing us come back to you with other rules that, uh, that fit the same kind of scenario. And I think Vince, you would agree too that I mean, there's some of these, and I thank you for that, Donna, because uh, when Mr. Brody and I approached this, I think it was an issue of fairness because a lot of us approached these issues with a lot of trepidation because we felt that somehow there was something wrong there. We, some of us agreed on some, perhaps not others, but we always had that trepidation of, of, uh, of making a decision on this case and thinking that this person had to go through that rigorous task of having to take the bar exam. Yeah. And many of us, that's, that's, uh, you know, that's, that's unfair. But uh, you know, it is what it is. And I think, and I thank uh, Donna for what they're doing in re-reviewing some of these rules, because again, there's an issue of fairness, I, I think here, and I, and I applaud them for doing so. If, if so there, Rodney was going to make a motion. Right. Yeah. If there, if there are no other, uh, if there are no other comments, that I'm going to make the motion that the uh, committee of bar examiners recommend to the board of trustees to circulate the proposed rules set forth in attachment A, as we've discussed. For Robbie, our I, I do have some comments. I, I'd like. Oh, I, I'm sorry, James. I'm sorry, Jim. Go ahead. Yeah. I'm sorry. I, I, I'm troubled by this, um, and I'm going to abstain. I'm not going to vote against it, but um, the scenarios you put together raise other problems that I think we have that maybe need to be addressed. And it seems to me what you're saying is we're lax in some areas, so we should be lax in more areas. And I just don't buy that argument. Um, I think the five-year rule has some good reasons to be there. Uh, people need to get their act together and get things done. Um, and so I'm just troubled by this. So I just want to say that, and that I'm not going to vote negative, but I am going to abstain. James, uh, let me just say, you know, uh, uh, you know, I, you and I started in this uh, uh, committee uh, at the same time, and I, I certainly get it. But, you know, when you look at uh, people who pass the bar, who get sworn in and go inactive that day, because they moved to another state, they don't want to pay bar dues in two states. Our bar dues are high. They go and active. That person can return and be active just by sending in a form with no additional, and they can do that 50 years later. So it didn't seem fair. And I think that's where Donna got this started. What's fair? What's fair to all applicants? And what do we lose in terms of public protection for applicants that do that later? And I think the conclusion was, I know it was, we don't lose anything. The, Vince brought up, I think, the most important point, which is that your moral character obligation is, must be updated. Uh, when you are ready. And again, James, as you know from our years, this is a, the lamb share of applicants. It's probably less than 10 per year. And you've heard the kinds of reasons. Most of them are what I mentioned, military, following a spouse to another state, not practicing. Uh, I, I didn't see the equity in requiring that applicant to retake the bar exam. Wow, that is a, a very high bar for someone for whatever reason has chosen not to do it. So you're right, to, to you and me, how could you not do the simplest part of the process, which is get sworn in? That can be free and it's, it's effortless. But those very few applicants each year that fall under this rule, I, I think the burden was too high. It was not fair. And I don't think we, as the Committee of Bar Examiners, lose anything 
in protecting the public by the delay. I, I certainly appreciate where you're coming from and, and I appreciate those comments that David will tell you we had the same concerns when we first met with Donna about this, but uh, that, that's where we landed. And I wanna make sure you know you get, that's how we came out where we did. And I understand on the other hand, when, when someone hires an attorney, they're putting their faith and trust in that attorney to get the job done. And when you tell somebody you've got to do a job in five years and they drop the ball and don't, if they do that to the client, the client's been damaged. Um, so I, I do think there's some public protection issues here, but I just, I wanted to express my view, that's all. And I'd, I'd like to jump in there. Are you hearing me? Yes. Um, in support of, of Jim's position. Um, I, I have misgivings about this. Um, I, I also believe that if, if an individual goes through the, all the, the pain and suffering of going to law school, taking the bar exam, and then does not follow through a, a very simple step in five years, um, that's a red flag to me that there's there's something something wrong and there's very few, few cases that we've seen that are really um, you know heart wrenching problems where someone gets immediately ill and is in you know in bed for five years or or has cancer or one thing or another. So um, I I think I. And, and the fact that it only uh, that we only get 10 um, cases a year seems to me not uh, reason enough to change a whole rule for everyone. Uh, I think that it, uh, it uh, cheapens the profession. If someone really um, values becoming an attorney and Obviously, they did at some point to go through all the problem of going to law school and uh, then taking the bar, but then uh, drops the ball on a, a, a simple thing that doesn't uh, cost a lot of money and doesn't take a lot of time. And um, if you just maybe you're taking the bar exam because and going to law school because your parents wanted you to, but you really don't want to, so you don't follow through that's not going to be a good attorney uh, 10 years later, uh, in my opinion. Uh, so I, I have misgiv misgivings. Um, I'm afraid I'm gonna to have to vote with, with, uh, with Jim and, and abstain. So one of the things that struck me as I spent a lot of time sort of parsing through all of these rules is although our rule suggests that it's a five-year rule, I would suggest that it's really not um, because when you all are looking at um, requests for extension, you look holistically at the entire five-year period and, and you say, you know, what, what has there been a barrier? And Dolores used a perfect example, you know, has someone been in the hospital for the last five years? And, um, and so let's, let's use that, that hospital example. So no, they haven't been in the hospital for the last five years. They had every intention of, um, of completing, you know, submitting their moral character application. They know there are no issues. They're licensed in two other states, um, but they didn't have to get a California licensure for their job that they have. And so they didn't want the, want the extra expense. They had every intention at you know four years and and two months or three months uh, in um, to go ahead and and get that license. Something happened then. Um, whether that thing is the pandemic, whether that thing is that's when they were hospitalized, but something happened at that point at four years and two months or four years and six months, and that's what stopped them from meeting that deadline. And, and as I was sort of thinking through it, that was one of the things that really sort of struck me because it, because it's really not a five-year rule. It's if you could have done it at year one or year two, when obviously most people do, but if you could have done it, we're not really going to give you the, the excuse that something came up in those last six or eight months 
um, because we look, we're looking holistically at the whole period and we're saying there was nothing that stood in your way, you know, at, at, at day one or, or day 365. And so it just, it felt to me like it was, even by saying it was a five-year rule was, was not quite an accurate representation of what we hold people to. Cause we don't tell them you better get sworn in now. Cause if we, at the end of the day, feel like there was a period when you could have done this and you chose not to, then, then we're unlikely to approve a request. And I go back to my point, attorneys have to live by time limits all the time. If you don't file your petition on time or you give your notice on time or you don't get your lawsuit to trial on time, your client gets suffrage from it. Lawyers have to understand time limits, that's important. And it's not five years, it's a time limit. You have to meet your time limit. That's my thoughts. Okay, well, if, if I could oh. add a quick comment, please, uh, Mr. Chair, if that's okay. Um, uh, thank you all to my colleagues for this very spirited discussion. Um, I, I'm going to come out and say that I've always been in opposition of this rule. Um, a part of it's because we've seen very traumatic, um, very harsh circumstances that people have presented. Um, and for me, I just don't believe in the ideology of people reliving their trauma. Um, and so I, I, I'm very supportive of this. Um, some of the circumstances that we have heard have, have been very extraneous. Um, and so I think it's, it's going to be important. And I know there was discussion about the, the amount, but I think the fact that we're going retro, I think it's going to increase that amount of individuals that will be um, accessible to enter the bar. And so I just think this is a, a great idea. Um, I want to thank the staff. I want to thank the team that participated on uh, establishing this. Um, and my personal opinion, I felt it was an arbitrary rule. Um, and from my um, experience and living in a underrepresented community, I think those rules impact certain folks in certain communities a little bit more than others. Um, and that's something that I've seen in my time here. I've been here since 2018. Uh, there are a handful of cases that I felt very passionate about that we should have uh, not restricted. And so I think doing this is, is justice. Um, and for me, it's something very passionate about that I care about. And um, I hope that uh, my colleagues and uh, the people on this commission support this um, initiative because I think it'll really, um, it really change lives. And, and I think that's something that I uh, think is important for the work that we do here. So thank you, Robbie. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Donna. And thank you to your team for, uh, for doing this such diligent work. This is Judge Torrealba. I would like to say one thing also. Um, as you know, I normally don't comment, but um, so what I would like to say is that the law changes all the time. The world is moving in a way where we are, the state bar is seriously considering allowing non-licensed attorneys to be able to assist via um, you know, mass websites and Amazon-like ways uh, to have people represented uh, in their, their um, legal, legal endeavors. I think that anything we do to make sure that there are licensed attorneys that um, want to and continue to represent individuals is very important. Um, and this is, is another step in that, that direction. I'd also like to point out that there are so many changes in the law uh, in my little world, uh, and from my pur purview of, of my little court, uh, the law has changed in so, way, so many ways that people that are sentenced for murder have the ability to re-petition the court even though it's 20, 30, 40 years later to get the sentence recalled, resentenced and reduced, if not the case dismissed. To hold individuals to choices they made uh, in their lives for whatever reasons, good, bad, and different, uh, 25, 10, 15, 20 years later is not in, in line with the spirit of how the law is moving at this time and to be able to address those issues and be current with the changing climate and the, um, the desire to be inclusive and not exclusive, I think this is a step in the right direction. In my opinion, not a big enough step, but it is a step in the right direction. So um, I hope that those of you that are holding on to that um, those draconian thoughts that people have to be held to their decisions they made five or 10 years ago. Um, we, we just can't live like that anymore. We have to, we, we need to be inclusive. We need to think, why did this happen? And have the tools to be able to make those decisions, um, to use our discretion when it's appropriate. Just because we have the tool 
doesn't mean that it's going to be used. So that's that's what I'd like to say. So um, uh, I'm going to make this motion. Thank you, everybody, <clears throat> that the committee of bar examiners uh, recommended the board of trustees to circulate the proposed rules set forth as attachment A, as we've discussed, for a 45-day public comment. Second. Second by my colleague, <laughs> Mr. Torres. Can we have a vote, please? Alex Lawrence? Yes. Dr. Bolton? Yes. James Efting? Stain. Robert Brody? Yes. Kareem Gangora? Yes. Dolores Heisinger? Abstain. Vince Reyes? Yes. Judge Torrealba? Yes. David Torres? Yes. Dr. Wilcoxon? Yes. And I believe the motion has carried. Thank you, everyone. So it, I'm looking at my watch. It's 1150. I'd like to go to a break and come back at 1215 for a working lunch. So please take an opportunity to take this break, maybe grab something to eat, use restroom facilities. We'll come back in open session at 1215 and we will uh, start with finishing the items in the chair's time and then remaining open items for Ed Sanders. Thank you for once 1215 Pacific time.
Welcome back, everyone. We'll give it a few more seconds before we do another roll call. Okay, welcome back everyone. Uh, would like to ask Mr. Angelus to do a roll call. Yes, Alex Lawrence. Here. Dr. Bolton. Is that Dr. Bolton? Robert Brody. Here. James Efting. Here. Kareem Gangora. Here. Dolores Heisinger. Here. Vince Reyes. Here. Judge Tor oh, thank you. Sorry. Judge Torialba. Here. David Torres. Dr. Wilcoxon. Here. Uh, Dr. Bolton. If you're here, I think your phone is on. Oh, there. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Thank you. <clears throat> and David Torres. Looks like just David Torres is not available. Not available. Does that mean we do not have quorum? We need David back for quorum. We do. Okay, great. So, as I mentioned before, we went to uh, break. We're going to finish up uh, some earlier items that we did put on hold. So, under the chair's time, item C. Sorry, sorry, Alex, we do need David back for quorum. I don't know if you oh. heard me. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Okay. We will uh, just wait maybe a couple more minutes because I believe I'm just looking through the rest of the agenda, including at standards. There we go. Oh, here's David. I see him. David, we see you wandering. <laughs> <laughs> Wander back. <laughs> hey, Caroline. All right, Mr. Torres, roll call. David Torres. Yep. Thank you. Sorry, I had a client drop in real quick. Uh, yeah. Thank you, uh, everyone. So as I mentioned earlier, we are going to circle back to some items that we did put on hold that require votes. Uh, under the chair's time, item C, approval of the April 22nd, 2022 Committee of Bar Examiners Public Meeting Minutes, attachment 100. I move I to accept the minutes. Thank you, Mr. Reyes. Is there a second? This is Robbie. I'll second. Can we have a vote, please? Yes. Alex Lawrence? Yes. Dr. Bolton? Yes. Robert Brody? Yes. James Efting? I wasn't present, so I'm going to abstain. Okay. Kareem Gangora? Yes. Dolores Heisinger? Yes. Vince, oh, thank you. Vince Reyes? Yes. Judge Tori Alba? Yes. David Torres? Yes. Dr. Wilcoxon? Yes. Uh, thank you. The motion carries. Thank you. And then the last item under the chair's time discussion of the sub entity administrative processes and procedures. Just to give you some background is that uh, the state bar engaged a consultant to review uh, meeting procedures and uh, some of the commentary that, uh, you know, hopefully many of you did receive a survey requesting responses from you, but they did talk about one of some of the reasoning is that there was a notice that there was a lack of consistency across the different boards. Um, uh, and the uh, board of trust wanted to um, was very interested in revisiting the uh, governance rules as well. So the consultant did send recommendations on agendas, minutes, uh, procedures for public comment, parliamentary procedures, and again, this is across a number of different um, committees and groups. 
There was a note that was sent on June 7th as a reminder that we have the ability to, through this survey, um, after you've had a chance to review these recommendations, um, your uh, opinions, your um, um, questions for more information, possibly. Uh, there is a deadline set for June 20th, that being Monday. So from what I understand, the response rate has been low uh, on this feedback. So I'm encouraging all the members to, if you haven't done so already, to take that survey uh, when possible by the deadline. Uh, working with the vice chair, uh, we did send feedback and our comments. Uh, I'm not going to share all the details of what we did uh, um, talk about or send, but uh, we were uh, inquiring or questioning uh, as it pertains to, um, for example, about uh, that further clarification. And this is based off of the uh, the consultant's recommendation, but looking for more or further clarification required about the exception for representatives of affected entities you know, schools in this case uh, being required or being able to comment um, we also commented on the area of uh, rosenberg's rules um, as summarized in an attachment it's not clear to us what problem uh, that was being addressed um, by that recommendation and then just in general you know where uh, as we talked earlier you heard from the director's report about us meeting in person or not in the future, um, just as part of a recommendation through the consultant, you know, we were questioning or even just really adamant about the importance of having more in person meetings um, and versus Zoom. And again, not necessarily stating a particular number, but just being adamant about uh, having the opportunity to have at least in person uh, meetings versus what was recommended. So Again, I don't want to share too much about what our uh, our feedback was on this. I want people to take the time and read the information and form your own opinions, but definitely submit that by the June 20th deadline. If you can't find it in your inbox, uh, by all means, let us know and we can forward that to you. Um, I was speaking with the attendees here in the uh, Los Angeles office and they were able to find it in their inbox and again it was recent uh june 7th so uh, please take that time to do that uh so with that are there any questions or comments before i turn it back over to ed standards okay so with that dr wilkinson can i turn it back over to you to continue the agenda items yes thank you very much agenda item 0403 Action on progress report related to changing category from fixed facility to distance, Irvine College of Law. I'd like to ask Ms. Leonard to give staff recommendations. Thank you. Uh, so the Committee of Bar Examiners approved uh, Irvine College of Law's uh, request to switch from the unaccredited category of fixed facility to distance. They plan to launch that program um, this summer. And yes, you may notice the name is different. Effective June 1st, the committee approved the change from Irvine University College of Law to Irvine College of Law, uh, complete with new uh, logo and communication materials. As part of the approval, the committee asked the school to meet several conditions um, and report back to the committee as of March 15th. Um, those, com those conditions were largely met. Um, in terms of creating the syllabi, the school found that they made significant progress but needed a little bit more time. And in fact, since March 15th, they have sent additional syllabi to the school, um, I'm sorry, to the state bar. Uh, thinking ahead, they've looked forward to their next reporting milestone. Um, and so the original recommendation um, goes only so far as we've discussed here. Uh, the school requested another condition proactively, uh, given that the first milestone took a little bit longer, but everything will still be ready before the launch. They've also asked for a little bit longer um, to complete their 2023 syllabi, providing a report back to the committee as of November 15. That happens to coincide with the annual report date, so they could very conveniently forward that report 
Um, so we have two motions, one that mirrors the staff recommendation, but one that also mirrors the additional request from the school, which they provided after the item posted. Um, so the staff recommendation would now be modified to accept the school's friendly amendment to adjust their second milestone um, in creating their program. And uh, for purposes of the PowerPoint, that would be the B version of the motion. First, there is an A, the staff version, and then there is a B on the next slide. Thank you, Ms. Leonard. Is there a representative from the college still here? Yes, Dean Leal is here, and I see he has raised his hand to make a public comment. Say, uh uh, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon. Thanks uh, for a few min minutes of your time. Uh, hopefully you can hear what I'm saying. Um, first, I want to thank uh, Ms. Leonard uh, for her always very, very uh, able assistance in shepherding this process of converting our entire curriculum and operation from fixed facility to distance learning. Uh, frankly, this is the largest, biggest, and most comprehensive change in the school's uh, history for almost 40 years. Um, and it has taken a, a good deal of time to, to do what, what A, the um, unaccredited rules and guidelines require, and, and B, uh, what I have uh, tried to do along with my faculty to um, do a thorough review and a comprehensive improvement and strengthening of our entire curriculum. Uh, and to do that, um, we are using a, a, a wide array of uh, online resources and embedding them into the curriculum. Um, and that's part of the issue. It takes time to do that. Um, it isn't just uh, taking our old syllabi and um, revising uh, the reading assignments to a new edition. Uh, it's taking um, sometimes 30, 40 hours of a professor's time or my time uh, looking at different resources and calculating time limits and then embedding them in each syllabi. Uh, it, it probably is, um, if not overkill, it certainly is, I think, um, uh, what the very best schools uh, do, and that's what has driven our efforts and what our goals are, is to become a better school. So uh, having additional time to uh, to do what we've done for our entire first year curriculum, um, most of our uh, second through fourth year curriculum, uh, we still have um, a number of electives that we need to build out along with other classes and courses we'll offer uh, starting in uh, January 2023. So uh, the added two months um, will go a long way to uh, assist us in meeting uh, the committee's um, goal of, of being fully informed as to the program that uh, our students will start actually on July 2nd um, uh, benefiting from. So uh, again, thanks to uh, Ms. Leonard and to the committee. Um, if there are any questions, I'm as always very happy to, to respond. Yeah, I guess not. Again, thank you. Thank you. Discussion from the committee. Is there a motion? Motion from the committee. Yes, this is Robbie. Uh, I will move. Is it the one on the screen right now? Yes. Yeah. It would be um, the, either the A version, the original, or the B with the additional friendly amendment from the school. Oh, yes. Then I want to, uh, I'm going to make the motion for uh, B uh, because I, I believe that that amendment is appropriate. And it's nice to see you, George. The committee of uh, bar exam, I'm, I'm going to make a motion that the committee of bar examiners receive and file Irvine Colleges of Law timely March 15th, 2022 progress report and June, 20, June 1st, 2022 addendum and find that the law school is in substantial compliance sufficient to continue its transition to being an unaccredited distance category law school and launching its new program in July of 2022 as scheduled. And I will further move that the CBE direct Irvine College of Law to report on November 15th, 2022, along with its annual report, all syllabi for courses to be offered in its 2023 winter spring semester scheduled to start in January of 2023. I'll second the motion. This is Vince. 
I'll take roll. Okay. Okay. Alex Lawrence? Yes. Dr. Bolton? Yes. Robert Brody? Yes. James Efting? Yes. Kareem Gangora? Yes. Dolores Heisinger? Yes. Vince Reyes? Yes. Judge Torrealba? Yes. David Torres? Yes. Dr. Wilcoxon? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Next agenda item 0404, Action on Periodic Inspection, American Institute of Law. So why a action of periodic inspection? Our last inspection was December 7th and 8th of 2021, and our inspection team made 16 recommendations. The law school reacted to the team's suggestions, but has yet to take action on the key recommendations. Matter of fact, just this morning, I was informed they filed info, which was beyond the 15 day deadline. And um, Dean, Professor Wilcoxon, um, I, I believe the late submission might actually apply to another school. Uh, this school responded and then provided a supplemental response at State Bar uh, request with more detail. Thank you. Okay, so the team's recommendation is grounded then on uh, key issues. Uh, one of which is high attrition, 90%, limited grading opportunities, lack of authentication of student work, and the law school's ability to accurately evaluate the law student's work. Because of this, we would like to suggest that we do an inspection in 2023 to provide the opportunity for the law school to demonstrate that its communication, admission, JD offerings and policies combined to create a sound JD educational program. Is someone from the college present? Yes. And I see that Dean Ed Green has asked to be recognized. Dean Green. We can we can hear you now if you if you would like to speak. Okay. Thanks for um, allowing me to have a word here. Um, when I looked at um, all the recommendations and whatnot, uh, my my question was, what is so substantially non-compliant. Uh, I believe our school has shown that we are more than substantially compliant with the guidelines and that the, the one sticking point, and I agree, is the authenticity and the exam process and everything, which I think a lot of schools have problems with all through this, even with the COVID and uh, all this distant learning. However, we have um, contacted exam soft which is the same software that the bar uses for their exams and we actually have a meeting with them a week from today um, and we're probably going to use their software their exam software their identification software and their monitoring software so all those three address the major issues that are lacking and so if we have that then I don't see why we need to have another on-site visit in 18 months uh, from now, uh, when we are in more than some, after that, we'd be in almost complete compliance. All of these other little things can be done remotely or through uh, some type of verification other than an on-site um, inspection. On-site inspections are expensive. They're $10,000. And so that is quite a financial burden that you place on us since we just had one. Uh, so I just, I'd, I'd like to understand 
why once we take care of the exam situation, which we can take care of all of those situations with ExamSoft, why we would need an on-site inspection and why things can't be done through periodic progress reports. So that's why I completely disagree with having an inspection uh, at the end of 2023. Um, so that's, that's, that's the school's view on it. And I would like to know the reason why. Staff or staff perspective, please. Sure. Um, so uh, looking at the team's recommendation, uh, there were a number of issues. Uh, these two deans, it should be noted, are very experienced. They have served as, as deans uh, to other schools prior. Um, they And so their significant experience should be recognized. Um, at the same time, the school is relatively new. They're just graduating their first couple of classes. And there were um, several things that uh, were suggested for further monitoring. A large portion of their curriculum was pass fail um, without a significant intermediate um, detail to give uh, an idea of how they were doing. Um, the attrition is extremely high, uh, well over 90% between the first and second year. Um, having a student body overall of around close to 70, just under 70, but graduating just a couple of students by the end of the program. Um, the classes that were graded did not have an authentication status. And when the school provided its first update um, well after the inspection, um, they still hadn't moved to, um, to produce any type of authentication. Um, upon a further second set of questions from State Bar staff, uh, Dean Green is correct. They very quickly uh, went ahead and looked at that RFP process. Um, so given that overall set of communication uh, and that the school is relatively newer and does have an extremely high attrition rate, it seems that the support of additional monitoring um, is appropriate. Discussion from committee. Uh, this is uh, uh, Robbie Brody. I, I, I rarely jump on these, jump in on these, and Dr. Wilcox and I, I, I have to applaud you. This is uh, the most uh, time consuming and challenging subcommittee at the CBE. And, uh, I very much appreciate it. But to Dean Green's comments, uh, you know, I've been looking at these reports for, for many years, and they're usually not this long. I think that we uh, err on, uh, on the side of being conservative. So my guess is that these concerns are legitimate. Uh, and I do value your years of experience uh, as a dean, uh, but I I also see that this is a new school, and I guess I want to know how would ExamSoft paying for the ExamSoft software? How would that address these problems? How how would the the address these concerns that the state bar has with keeping your school open? It would address one specific concern, which is the authentication of student work uh, so that the school can conclusively identify those taking the exam and that it produces the product is their own work. Um, so they're being personally evaluated. Um, so that is uh, spot on as to one specific recommendation. And we do hope that the school has a successful opportunity to partner with the, the vendor or method of their choice. Wouldn't you agree, Natalie, this is an extraordinary large number of course correction recommendations for this kind of review? Um, yes, I do, especially and especially because the school is relatively new in graduating students. Um, this is an opportunity to help get uh, keep the school you know, moving on a firm footing and to be able to um, give the students that are enrolling a good opportunity to graduate. I feel like and Natalie, tell me if, if that the school has sort of a, a fiduciary obligation to these 75, 80 students committing to the time and financial expense. Do, do you ag agree? Well, um, they do. They do have several duties that are enumerated in the rules in terms of transparency and providing a sound um, a sound means of education. Uh, students may withdraw for or be dismissed for any reason at all, but given the very high dismissal rate here, 
uh, it, it does call into question the, the whole virtuous cycle of the system and whether adjustments need to be made uh, to give a more reasonable opportunity to graduate. And the school could have some choice as to which portions are modified. Uh, whether it be communication, the actual execution, the academic support, uh, but given this uh, graduation rate, uh, it does seem that change is warranted. And Natalie, when um, when the dean talked about uh, an inspection costing ten thousand dollars, did he mean that's what the state bar charges the school to conduct the inspection? Um, that's true. Uh, registered schools are inspected based on a fee schedule that's publicly posted um, in categories A, B, or C, which uh, depend on the size of the student body. Uh, the larger the school, generally the more work involved and uh, the higher the cost of the inspection. Um, it is very uh, time consuming to do this sort of review, but you certainly can see how it does uh, contribute to protect the public. And uh, looking at the various aspects will be time consuming, but will be time well invested. Oh, I, I, I don't doubt the time. I just wondered, is that the cost? Because this is a really small school. There are not even 100 students. Uh, it is. It is. It's just under. Uh, but is that what the cost would be or already was and would be for the next inspection? That's correct. Oh. So it, then for uh, larger schools that we look at, the inspection cost is higher. That's correct. Oh. Uh -huh. um, and did you say, Natalie, I, I think I got a little mixed up, that the response from this school was timely or it was not timely? Yes, it was timely. And when staff provided additional questions and asked for additional detail and actions in some instances, the response was prompt. Um, so after the inspection, they did not proactively take the actions, but upon a second set of staff questions, the response was prompt. And thorough. Okay, well, I'm ready to make a motion on the staff recommendation unless there are other CBE members that want to add in. I'm sorry, Amy, did you say something? Sorry, I did, but um, at the same time, my um, uh, Amazon went off. Um, so one quick question, uh, Natalie, I just wanted to clarify one thing. Um, the inspection uh, costs, uh, are the, do they reflect an on-site or um, or a remote inspection? Um, and that would, be, that would be the price for either. For either. And so there's no differential in the prices for either one. The differential is that um, travel costs are billed and if the if it is an in-person inspection and so ultimately a remote inspection is less expensive because there are no travel costs involved. Mm -hmm. Okay, just curious. Are there comments by committee? Natalie, I, this is Robbie. I have one more question for you that the Dean was talking about using it exam soft uh, for <laughs> and you've explained the, the goal there. Can we require or direct schools like this to conduct their exams in person, which is the preferred method for, for us? ExamSoft was a, a COVID-related uh, uh, idea for us, the, the better uh, and more sound uh, testing processes in person, which we return to. Can we ask law schools to do the same? Uh, the in-person method is, is not required in the rules, but having a means to authenticate them accurately is, and different schools have done that in different ways. You are correct that the most common is either an in-person um, or some sort of remote proctoring. Um, so the schools do have some choice under the rules and ExamSoft would be within those choices. Uh -huh. I, I would like to ask, I don't mean to belabor this, ask the Dean why uh, the school does not require in-person examination, just like the state bar does. 
But to be yes. clear before the school responds that there are other schools that use remote methods. And so this would school, this school would not be the first, but I'll defer to the Dean as to his reasoning. Okay, thank you for the question. Um, I have students that are all over the United States. I have a student in Israel. Uh, so it would be difficult for them to come in for exams. Uh, having a distant oh. learning um, slash correspondent school it's uh, difficult to have um, on-site uh, exam taking. Uh, we, I, I used to work, I used to be the, I was the founding dean at uh, Abraham Lincoln University. And we used to have all students had to have either come into school or they had proctors. And uh, the proctor program worked out okay, but you just weren't sure who these proctors were. Uh, sometimes I would find out that they were uh, the student's brother-in-law who's a doctor or something and so that was not uh, the best th situation so we started using examsoft back then and examsoft especially now with the monitoring and the um, proctoring with artificial intelligence seems to address all the issues uh, that the bar really has uh, identification everything uh, identification verification, uh, secured uh, ex um, uh, computer, and also uh, the monitoring and proctoring of the situation works for distant learning uh, education perfectly. So, Dean Green, what have you been using since you uh, opened this school? Well, we have an LMS um, learning management system that we use and in it is an exam um, software, an exam module for it. Uh, but uh, I found that I, I've been doing a lot of research on it. It doesn't have as much security, plus it doesn't have any proctoring at all. So uh, again, someone could log in and uh, their brother-in-law that's an attorney could take the exam for them. And we wouldn't know that or the person could be standing right next to them as they did the exam. So using proctoring software is uh, absolutely necessary. And I, I believe in that too, that I wanna make sure that the uh, students uh, are, the per are the people that are taking the exam. Uh, it's just the integrity of everything. It goes all the way to the bar exam. I remember when I took the bar exam, one of the first announcements was, we know there are people that cheat on this exam. And, and if you go online with all of these um, uh, online proctoring and everything, there's all kinds of YouTubes out there on how to defeat them. So nothing is absolutely full, foolproof, but you know, we're gonna try, try to take every step that we can to ensure that these students are taking that exam and that they're doing it in a secure environment where we can minimize uh, any possibility of any cheating. And Dean, I'm sorry, I have, I have one more question for you sure. there, if that's okay. What do you, the attrition rate at your school, at least as reported by uh, our staff, it's, it's uh, astoundingly high, if it's as high as 90%. What do you attribute any attrition to at your school? Well, first off, uh, there's not a lot of, dis uh, we don't dismiss a lot of students. Uh, a lot of students will, uh, I think a lot of students that attend a part-time law school uh, take it as this is like junior college. You know, if you don't, you, you take copious notes and you don't even have to buy the textbooks. Law school is not like that. And I think a lot of students feel that they are overwhelmed by the amount of work that we do. We do, every student goes uh, approximately five hours in classes a week even though we're correspondents and we don't require that they have to, we have those classes. So we have a lot of classes for the students who attend, uh, work for them to do, uh, studying exams. And um, our first year class, I, I teach all the first year subjects, contracts, torts, and criminal law. And we, I, I see a lot of students that will drop out because they just feel overwhelmed with the work. They didn't think it was going to be as difficult as it was. But then we have a lot of people, especially during the pandemic, that lost their jobs. 
So they left for financial reasons, which we have no control over. We have people that had deaths in their families. They had to leave. And so there was a lot of uh, factors recently that we had no control over that attributed to our attrition rate. Plus also, I, am, I, am, I, I admit I'm not an easy grader, but I think that our statistics on the baby bar prove themselves. Uh, from the statistics we need to supply to the bar from 2017 till 2020, um, every student, first year student who uh, finished the first year with a, a 2.0 grade point average, we had a 100% pass rate on the baby bar. And students with a 1.5 and above had a 64.3% pass rate on the bar. So I think the program speaks for itself and those students that don't make it, they, uh, they don't pass that bar, uh, that baby bar. So I'm, I'm confident that now we're trying to also implement that into our upper class. I believe there is some grade inflation going on that I want to correct. And so that uh, our, our, we, we started our school we had a lot of transfer students, so it's very difficult to understand if they don't pass the bar, why? Is it because of classes they took at other schools? I'm not sure, but we had our first graduate not too long ago who was our first one who started from the very beginning to the end. She passed the baby bar first attempt. She passed the general bar first attempt. So I think we have a uh, decent program. Uh, I, like I said, there's I look at our statistics and I look at our uh, attrition rate and there's a lot of that in the attrition rate that cannot be accounted for by anything that we're doing wrong. Uh, I think there's a lot of other factors involved, including the baby bar. After three attempts on that baby bar, if they don't pass, we have to um, administratively dismiss the students. We have no control over that. So there are other factors that we, we are against that other schools aren't, accredited schools are not against that because they don't have to take that first year law students exam. All right, thank you, Dean Green. I, I appreciate you being so responsive. Um, and thank you, Dr. Wilcoxon, again for, wow. I just wanna ask uh, Dean Green one quick question. Sure. With the attrition rate, are you asking the students who leave why? We, well, we do know why they, because they withdraw, they have to fill out a petition and they give us a reason why they, they're leaving. And we counsel with them. And there's many students who lose their jobs and they actually do come back. So they're not leaving because whenever somebody says, well, I'm leaving for this reason, are you sure that's the right reason? Because they, they may be saying that, but it's not true, right? So, but then they come back. And so then we know that uh, they've been, they, most students that leave, are sorry, are sorry that they have to leave. And um, so we've, we have one student actually, who's I think has been with us. She's starting the fourth time. She has a very serious medical condition and um, she um, uh, is a lot in a lot of pain all of a sudden. And she's been going through some treatments. And so now she's found somewhere where she's taking treatments that help her. So she's hoping that she's gonna be able to get through this time. But um, so she, I don't know if she would have been accounted for an attrition rate because she would have left us, came back, left us, came back. Uh, and so it's, I don't know if she's counted as three attritions, I don't know, um, but she's back. And so I, uh, I don't know, it, it's, it's, it's difficult to, to, I'm trying, we try to do everything we can. I, I've even changed the first year curriculum somewhat to help the students be able to be more successful during, during their first year. So, uh, and I, I sent those new uh, syllabi to uh, Natalie. And, uh, and so we showed, uh, I showed her how we're gonna do that. Now, they haven't been implemented yet, but they are in the process of being implemented. So we'll see how those work out. And I'll report those on the progress on our annual report because there is a section in the annual report as to how we're doing for attrition rates and things like that. So that's where we will report the, the and hopefully it's gonna be a positive. Thank you, Dean Green. Are there any other questions or comments from the committee? Is there a motion? 
Um, Thank you, staff, for showing. Is there a motion from the group? <laughs> All right, uh, this is Robbie. I will make the motion that the CBE receive and file the 2021 periodic inspection report of the American Institute of Law and the response from the law school documenting its progress and objections. Further, that the report's recommendations be adopted and that the law school be directed to document completion of the recommendations as part of the law school's 2022 annual periodic compliance report. And further, that the accreditation of the American Institute of Law be continued and that the law school's next periodic inspection be scheduled for 2023, unless the committee determines that an inspection is needed sooner. So- Excuse, excuse uh, me, can uh, you hear me? Hello? Yes, I can hear you, Dean Green. Uh, be, be, I, I, I appreciate this motion, but um, I think if you pass this motion, there's going, there could be an argument that you've just given uh, American Institute of Law, a accreditation. If you look at that further move, that the accreditation of American Institute of Law, we are not an accredited law school. That should read further move that the registration of American Institute of Law. I apologize, Dean Green is in fact correct. Thank you, Dean Green. Okay, I don't want you to pass it, then have to try to... <laughs> All right, I, I'd enjoy having been a registered um, accredited law school for the next 15, uh, 18 months. But. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate you, uh, you uh, calling that out, uh, Dean Green. And, and committee members, this is this uh, a yes vote on this adopts the recommendations of the staff, which is that all of those points be specifically addressed by the school. Uh, so uh, uh, I, I just don't see where we can do any better than that. I'll second, Mr. Chair. Seconded by Mr. Torres. Yeah, vote please. Alex Lawrence. Yes. Dr. Bolton. Dr. Bolton. Robert Brody. Yes. James Efting. Yes. Kareem Gangora. Yes. Dolores Heisinger? Yes. Vince Reyes? Yes. Judge Toyalba? Yes. David Torres? Yes. Dr. Wilcoxon? Yes. And Dr. Bolton? Oh, shoot. I believe we need Dr. Bolton in order to meet. Did you hear me this time? Yes. Dr. Bolton? Yes. Okay, thank you. Did you get me? Yes, yes, we heard yeah. you. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you. Agenda item 0405, action of major change, change category from fixed facility to distance and waiver requirements to teach fixed facility classes, Pacific Coast University School of Law. I ask Ms. Leonard to give staff recommendations. Uh, certainly. Pacific Coast University School of Law uh, recently transitioned from accredited to registered status. Uh, while they are a fixed facility school during the period of the pandemic, they've been teaching successfully online through use of a waiver. Um, and so they've decided to uh, permanently ask to switch to the category of uh, a distance teaching. Um, when this was originally filed, they had been planning to launch this summer, but they filed very close to the last committee meeting and um, the, beyond the time that is normally required to process a motion. Uh, when they learned it would be on the June agenda, they delayed the start of the official program until um, 2023. Uh, so you'll see a summer time for this summer discussed in the motion and then an addendum that explains the change um, so that there is plenty of time to launch um, that clearly. Uh, there are two choices as to the motion. Is it folded? Um, the, 
the first one is to uh, give a schedule very similar to that what was given to um, Irvine College of Law to document the completion of the curriculum prior to it being offered. Um, staff noticed in the original presentation, the school asked for four months to get the program up and going. So the staff recommendation would have given five to seven months asking the school to document completion along with their annual report. Um, the school, now that they're delaying for another year, um, has asked that they have until June 2023. That request came in after the item was posted. Uh, doing so in 2023 would afford um, it afford latitude to the school if the committee had any comments, um, a June timeline um, would not afford the committee time to uh, provide those comments back to the school. You might choose a, a, a January, February timeframe in order to do that. Hello, uh, or if, it, Judge Torrealba, did you have a question? I'm going to run on mute. I think you can go go ahead, Natalie. Oh, perfect. Okay, so you will see an A and B version of the motion. Both uh, do approve, uh, recommend approving this change from the fixed facility to the distance category. Um, the B motion uh, would uh, embody the school's request to report back to the committee, not with their annual report in November, but prior to the August 23 start in uh, June of 2023. Um, and Professor Wilcoxon, I don't know if you have any thoughts as to the timing. I know you had been um, studying that. Yeah, I, I was thinking just from a time perspective, what would be best for staff to accommodate this? I think it is a question as to what the committee prefers. Um, the purpose of the reporting milestones um, is to make sure that the materials are correct prior to the students beginning the course, giving the students enough time to know what they're signing up for, uh, for public protection and consumer transparency purposes. Um, and it depends on the level of oversight that the committee um, thinks is appropriate. So a check-in, hey, they're done. Um, I think June 2023 could work. If the committee wants to be able to have a discussion with the school, um, I would recommend a, a January timeframe, but we can hear from the dean who is here because that would allow you to place it on the March or April motion. Um, generally, there's a meeting in March or April, um, but missing those, there wouldn't be time for a, a two-way conversation. And you can see in the case of Irvine, uh, there was a benefit to the two-way conversation. Uh, Irvine is, is making significant progress and um, you had a productive conversation today. So I think those are the two choices before you. Thank you. Is the, the Dean available? Yes, uh, Dean Desis is here and he has raised his hand to speak. Dean Desis, you can unmute. I'm so sorry about that. I hope I didn't hit the wrong button. Um, good afternoon, uh, members of the committee, members of the staff. Thank you very much. Natalie, thank you very much for the, uh, the presentation of the, our requests regarding the timetable. Um, I will speak uh, to that, Dr. Uh, Wilcoxon, specifically on the timetable. Uh, I am a lapsed litigator. Litigators always want more time. Uh, we always think we can do a better job uh, with a little more time. Uh, also, as a lapsed litigator, if you if you all tell me, no, I think we'd like this at such and such time. Oh, it will be done. All of the syllabi will be um, built out. I have things in line um, that if and when the uh, uh, the hoped for uh, granting of the of the pending application is effectuated, we will begin immediately. Uh, I uh, and uh, one of the long experienced PCU professors uh, will begin working in consultation with the um, with, with the uh, faculty members teaching the respective courses, uh, as well as our uh, registrar and. Um, Associate Dean, who is here today also. Uh, and 
We will get it done whenever you say uh, we need to get it done. Uh, originally, uh, in, in consultation with Natalie, the idea was to um, have all of the syllabi completed and built out uh, and compliant, of course, um, uh, and made part of the November annual compliance report. And so my thought was, well, we can, we, we can do some or many of them by November, and then may I have a few more months thereafter. Uh, I entirely get uh, what Nat the, the point that Natalie just made that it might not be time for the, you know, the feedback process with the meet and confer process. Uh, if, 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 if I could have January or February um, uh, to get it all done, uh, I, will, I will represent to you uh, that that is exactly uh, what will happen. Did that, did that respond, are there any particular sub questions or details that I or Ms. Cassis, our um, registrar can um, address? Hey, Natalie. Oh, I'm sorry, did some, was someone else speaking? Go ahead then. I, I was gonna ask Natalie, with respect to uh, the proposed motion, um, are we pretty much firm? We are firm on the August 23, 2023 date. Am I correct? You're muted. I'm Natalie. sorry, I'm muted. Uh, I believe that's the date that the school intends to launch. And so they will continue on a COVID waiver to teach classes online as they have throughout the pandemic. But the actual rollout of their curriculum that will be the permanent distance category would happen next summer and August is the beginning of their quote fall right. semester. Uh -huh. uh, and that start date is embodied in both of the uh, proposal choices. Um, and the, the date is up to the committee as to when to turn in the syllabi. So the short answer is yes, August 2023rd is the start date. Okay. Hey, this is, uh, this is Robbie. Natalie, can you hear me? Yes, I can. And Natalie, you know you know how much I value what you bring to the table on all of these. But I, you know, I have to ask you. It, it seems like the schools around me, whether it's high school, community college, everybody is moving towards going back to the classroom. You know, we're trying to live in the post-COVID world, and I think the consensus is that classroom learning uh, is the best learning and. It seems with some of these schools, like the one we're talking about now, they're going in the opposite direction. They want to use the, the COVID temporary status. And I don't, don't you feel, or do you feel that that sort of detracts from the experience that these students are going to be committing to financially and otherwise? Uh, we haven't done a specific study as to that, so it would be hard for me to speak. But one thing that would be true um, with the general population in the registered and accredited schools versus others is that most of them are mid-career learners um, that may have more than average um, number of things that they are balancing, uh, parenting, working in a job, perhaps being a first responder, uh, perhaps taking care of elderly parents. Um, and also the professors uh, tend to be of age categories that have been identified as more at risk for COVID mm -hmm. purposes. Um, so it is possible that that's something to be considered with this population of schools versus um, a K through 12 or an undergrad or, or an ABA approved uh, full-time type law school. Um, I think the other thing to note here is that the school is presenting to you a permanent plan um, to change their category and offer a distance education. Um, and they have a clear communication strategy uh, to their current students as well as their prospective students. Um, and, and they'll be teaching that way going forward. Uh, what, unfortunately, they were not able to get the application for distance learning in timely to start it this fall. Um, but you do see that here. And so in this case, keeping them on a distance status 
could address those concerns that might be present at this school, but also it will provide a smooth bridge to their permanent program uh, because their students have been on distance for two years and they now see that just one year from now, that will be the permanent course for this school. Thanks, I appreciate it, Natalie. What's your preference between A and B, Natalie? Um, as, bet as between A and B, I, I think it's up to the school, I mean, up to the committee. Uh, certainly from a staff perspective, the November is very helpful, but with, um, with the start of the school in, um, in August, it is possible to provide some latitude with the school while still affording full discussion to the committee. And um, I do believe January would be very reasonable, um, and particularly if the school is able to provide what they have along with their annual report um, and then uh, complete it uh, by January. Dean Desi, uh, does that seem reasonable? Yes, yes, Natalie. Great. Very reasonable if if the committee can accommodate us to that extent. I appreciate it. And so a, a friendly amendment to the motion could be to provide progress to date in the annual report and then full progress as to those recommend full completion as to those recommendations, January 15, 2023. Thank you, Natalie and Dean and David. Uh, if there's no more discussion, I'll be uh, prepared to make that motion with uh, that friendly amendment. If you can put it up, Natalie. And I'll Thank second you. that. Uh, that would be the B version of the motion with the friendly yes. amendment to change the reporting deadline. Yeah. To progress to date uh, with the annual report and completion of milestones by January 15th. Oh, brother. Well, I need to have my LASIK redone if, it, if it's going to be if it's going to be that. Wait, let me pull this up on, on my screen. Just give me one moment. I have it here. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to move that the uh, Committee of Bar Examiners receive and file PCU College of Law request for major change to transition to the distance learning category of teaching as a registered unaccredited law school and provisionally grant the request with a program launch timing of August 2023, subject to the following conditions. Progress reports on milestones to be provided on a schedule provided by staff by June 15th, 2023. The law school must submit the curriculum and credit content for the distance program, class syllabi for the distance category program, comparing the 3.5 credit current versions to the three credit new versions, a copy of the policy that is, establishes procedures for verifying each student's preparation and study. And finally, no, not finally, the law school's methods and mes metrics it will use to monitor and adjust the effectiveness of the new courses. And finally, sample transcripts submitted to the staff for evaluation. Further, that the committee receive and file the law school's request to extend its waiver to teach classes online through August 31st, 2023, while still in the fixed facility category. And uh, Mr. Uh, Judge Brody, I would uh, request the friendly amendment to strike uh, by June 15, 2023 from this motion to effectuate the schedule that was discussed. Yes, and my... Uh, Motion includes that friendly amendment. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you. And that Is was your down. Do you want me I'll to oh. do you want me to change I'll... the date? Sorry, Natalie. Oh, just to delete uh by June 15, 2023, and then capitalize the T. Perfect. Thank you. I'll second. This is Kareem. Can we have a vote? That was a mouthful. <laughs> Alex Lawrence? Yes. Dr. Bolton? Yes. Robert Brody? Yes. James Efting? Yes. Kareem Gangora? Yes. Dolores Heisinger? Yes. Vince Reyes? Yes. Judge Torrealba? David Torres? Yes. Dr. Wilcoxon? Yes. Judge Torrealba? 
And shall we circle back later to meet quorum? Okay, yes. Okay, agenda item 0406, action on progress report related to periodic inspection and notice of non-compliance, People's College of Law. Um, briefly, uh, the committee reviewed the People's College of Law progress report. And at that meeting, we directed the law school to one, file an amended progress report and two, respond to outstanding staff requests, both within 30 days. The director was also mailed to them. People's College did not respond within 30 days, but they did file an amended progress report on June 3rd, documenting recent changes and updates. Consistent with prior guidance requiring the law school to demonstrate sustained compliance, it's recommended that the committee issue a notice of non-compliance to the law school. Is there a representative from the college present? Yes, the attorney for People's College of Law, Ira Spiro, is present and has raised his hand to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, committee members. I've met uh, a lot of you before when before the uh, these meetings went remote. Um, boy, all I can see is a blank screen in front of me with my name on. All right. In any event, um, uh, I hope you have seen the letter that I sent to you all, uh, dated June eight. Um, as you know, the uh, what's what's be the issue for a decision is whether to issue a notice of non-compliance uh, to our law school. Oh. Um, here we are. Uh, the I, I want you. To, not all of you know uh, a lot about our school. I think, so, especially the new members. Um, very briefly, um, our school was started in 1974 and it's been continuously operating since then as a, uh, a uh, brick and mortar school um, and with a, a mission to increase the access to the legal profession and access to justice for the community in general for low income, people of low income and people of color. And uh, to that end, nearly everyone who provides services to the school, the professors, and practically everyone else, uh, including myself, uh, serve without pay. Um, the, and our, our graduates are, by and, by and large, way more than by and large, 